Okay, hello and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 edition of the Planet Party. My name is Michael Reed, and I'm the Public Outreach Coordinator for the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. And we are one of the hosts for this event, uh, along with a bunch of people from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So this event is being jointly hosted by uh, various folks at the University of Toronto, as well as our partners at the RASC. So before we begin, we want to start with uh, our traditional land acknowledgement. So we at the University of Toronto wish to acknowledge that this land on which the university operates has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. All right, so we're going to get into the event very soon, but I just want to get you oriented as to what to expect before we plunge right in. So our goal tonight is to connect you with the sky. Wherever you are in the world, a lot of what we share is going to be uh, accessible to you. So some of our main targets tonight are going to be the Moon, Jupiter, and Saturn. And those are visible to everybody. So no matter where you're tuning in from, even if it's daytime for you right now, when it is nighttime, you'll be able to see those things. Uh, but we're also gonna show you some things that you can't see just with your naked eye. And for that, we're relying on all of our partners at the Royal Astronomical Society, who are distributed uh, in several different provinces in Canada. We have folks in Ontario, in Quebec, and in Nova Scotia. To try and bring you views, we're gonna hopefully cloud-proof ourselves in case anyone gets clouded out, we'll switch to somebody else. Uh, and we're going to do a bunch of looking through their telescopes, seeing what they see. We're going to show you in just a moment how to find some of these things in the sky with your unaided eye. So if you'd like to, feel free to take your, your device with you outside and follow along with us in the real sky if it's clear for you where you are. Uh, we're going to do a bunch of other things. We're going to play some games. We're going to learn a little bit about the science behind uh, the moon and uh, Jupiter later in the evening. We've got some fantastic prizes to give away. Uh, we've got a couple of telescopes, including one very deluxe uh, computer-controlled full-on telescope. Uh, very fancy telescope if you've never used one before, but also friendly to beginners. So we'll have two rounds of games during which you can win those and a host of other prizes, including a membership in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, where you can attend meetings and get advice from people about how to get involved in uh, astronomy. Uh, we've got a bunch of t-shirts and uh, books and all sorts of things to give away. You'll hear more about those during our game segments. Uh, you can feel free, come and go during the stream. We'll be broadcasting for about two hours. So until about uh, 10.30 in our local time, uh, two hours from now. And uh, if you're enjoying, feel free to, uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe. We have uh, various people monitoring our chat, including some astronomers. So if you're interested in asking some of your science questions in the chat, please feel free to do that. Later in the broadcast, we're going to have a panel discussion about the ethics of space colonization. So we'll be soliciting questions from you uh, in the chat uh, at that time. Uh, as I say, uh, one of the main things we want to encourage you to do during this event, or if you can't do it today, is to actually go outside. So the things we're going to show you today are relevant even, you know, tomorrow, next week. The moon will move around a little bit, but Jupiter and Saturn move very, very slowly. So we're going to show you how to find them in the sky tonight. But if you can't go out tonight, go out tomorrow, go out the next day. It's not going to matter. It's going to be about the same. Okay. So we're going to have a, a kind of variety show format for you. We're going to move through a whole bunch of different segments uh, throughout the night. And I'd like to move on to our very first segment where uh, my colleague Michael O'Shea is going to teach you how to find Jupiter and Saturn in the sky, among other things. So Michael is a graduate student at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, where he studies access to education for Indigenous students. He also uh, works at a public outreach organization called Popscope. So you may live in a city that has a, uh, a Popscope center, and what they do is they set up telescopes on street corners at times in the world when that's a possible thing to do and allow uh, everyone to look through those to provide access for people who might not normally have access to a telescope. 
So our very first segment will be from Michael O'Shea and just give me a few seconds and we will transfer over to Michael. So I think that's a few seconds and I hope you're able to hear me wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, it's too bad we can't be in person um, all around a telescope together, um, but I hope we uh, can have a good time tonight and learn a little bit about the night sky. So as Dr. Reed mentioned, um, I'll kick things off with a, a way to orient yourself in the night sky. Um, I'm going to do that using an online um, planetarium website. So you may have used these on your phone. There's different apps like this. Or if you're more old school, like me, you may have used a physical planisphere. But whatever you use, it's a reproduction of the sky in your hand or on your computer screen. So hopefully you're able to see uh, my screen here, uh, which is a, a screenshot of an online application called Stellarium. And this is the web version. Uh, there's a desktop version that has some more features. Um, but the Stellarium web version you can access without downloading and is plenty good for tonight's demonstration. So I'll give you a second to look that up if you're on a device. The website for that is stellarium-web.org. Stellarium-web.org. You can just Google Stellarium. Something should come up. Dr. Reed mentioned we really encourage you to go outside where it's safe um, and look at the night sky. And what's great about this is if you have an internet-enabled phone, you can take this outside or your laptop and use this to see what's actually in the night sky. If you do that, I encourage you to use the night mode, um, which will, will protect your eyes, um, will preserve your night vision. Um, so by turning this to red, um, it'll ensure that the glare from your computer screen uh, doesn't ruin your so-called night vision. And you'll be more sensitive to distant light that's coming from the stars and planets around us. So if you haven't used one of these applications before, it might be a little confusing at first. Um, here I'm looking what would be north. Um, it's not quite the landscape around me here. I'm in a very urban part of Boston, Massachusetts, in the States. Um, and, um, but I, I know that it's north because I can make out the Big Dipper here. And even in a very light polluted place like Boston, Toronto, you should be able to make out um, the stars of the Big Dipper. Um, and you can use these two stars to point you to the North Star here. And if you click on it in your app, it'll also give you a little bit of information about it. There's a little bit of lag tonight, but if you're following along on your end, uh, if you click on that North Star there, uh, it should give you some information about uh, the North Star or Polaris. So now that we've oriented ourselves to the north, um, we can use north to look at other parts of the sky. So rotating to the right, we'll be moving to the east, where we see um, the moon has just risen. And moving to the south here, oh wow, we see Jupiter and Saturn um, in the south, so directly opposite the Big Dipper. And it, if I look outside my window right now, which faces south, I can actually see Jupiter and, and Saturn. You'll notice that the application is real time. So everything in the night sky is going to appear to creep a little bit every minute and even more every hour. And that's because of the Earth's rotation. If you came back tomorrow or a few days later, things would also be tilted. And that's because the Earth is orbiting the sun. So everything um, tomorrow, things will be one degree different. What's great about Stellarium is you can also time travel. So say you want to look at what the night sky looked like on your birthday or even tomorrow. You can uh, use this feature here and change the date. So I could change it to the 25th is tomorrow or, or yesterday using this feature here. You can also advance the, um, the application. So if I'm daydreaming at work during the work hours about what the night might look like tonight, I can speed up time and set it to the evening or even in two hours. So I can see there's a little bit of lag on my end, um, but don't take my word for it. Try it on your end, and you'll see if you can speed up and um, look into the future of the night sky. 
It also looks straight up. And if you look straight up from your location, um, even, even in Toronto, you might be able to make out the summer triangle. And although that we're moving away from summer, the summer triangle is still visible. Um, the pattern made by three very bright stars, uh, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. I can click on some of those. Uh, nope, that's not it there. That's Polaris. A little bit of a lag again here. These three stars um, form the summer triangle, uh, which will also be visible even in a very uh, light polluted area. I'm in Boston and the application set to my location, but you can set it to your location. Um, you do that by clicking in the lower left uh, corner there. So I'm in Boston now. Let's say I wanted to join my colleagues in Toronto. I can do Toronto, search for that, click it, set it. And because Toronto is a little bit further north and a lot further west, you'll see that the next guy is a little bit, a little bit different, but not, not too different. We're looking at a, at a, at a similar sky. Um, I talked about the Little Dipper, or the, sorry, the Big Dipper and the Summer Triangle. Um, these are part of some bigger constellations that you might be familiar with. Um, the Big Dipper is part of Ursa Major, or the Big Bear, it's Latin for Big Bear. And I can see those constellations here by toggling um, the constellation feature on and off. So there we have um, the lines of the constellations. I can even throw up some constellation art. Um, the default constellations are the Greek or Roman tradition, um, but on the desktop version of Delam, you can actually look at different cultures, um, views of the night sky, different cultures, star knowledge. I think they're always adding um, more constellations in there, but I know at the moment, for example, there is um, Ojibwe star knowledge in the application. There is Navajo star knowledge. Um, and as Dr. Reed made our land acknowledgement, it's important to recognize not only are we on indigenous land, um, but people on this land have their own knowledge systems and their own um, astronomy traditions and their own science. So um, great and fun way to learn about um, indigenous knowledge is by exploring indigenous star knowledge. And in fact, um, the Big Dipper is a great place to start. Um, the, the Big Dipper and Ursa Major, the bear, figures in a lot of different constellations um, around the world. But the bear comes up a lot. Um, in fact, for the Mi'kmaq in northeastern North America, um, the bear is part of a, a bigger pattern and story, uh, which involves a, a large bear being chased by seven birds that are, are hunting the bear. I won't tell the story because I myself am not indigenous. I encourage you um, to do some research. Uh, there's some great online resources um, by Mi'kmaq authors, by Mi'kmaq elders. Um, but briefly, um, the Mi'kmaq story also um, is a way to explain um, the, the shift in the night sky from day to day that is uh, celestial motion and a way to show how seasons on Earth are tied to what's happening in the night sky. And that story is Moon and the Seven Bird Hunters. For myself, I'm from an Irish background, um, and I would be comfortable talking a bit about what the Big Dipper might mean in an Irish tradition. Um, while some cultures saw a, a bear in the night sky, um, others saw a, uh, a circle or a cart um, or a shrimp. Um, for the ancient Irish and the ancient British, they saw a plow, which is tied to their ag agricultural traditions, as you can imagine. Um, this was the great plow in, in, in the night sky. What's interesting is that this ancient concept, um, which survived the influence of Greek and Roman astronomy, um, came up again in the early 20th century. Um, when the Irish were fighting for their independence. And this um, big dipper or plow was actually put on a flag and it was waved um, as part of the Irish independence movement. It was waved um, in, in Dublin in 1916, one of the first flags that was raised. And that flag had the plow on it. And for um, Irish Independence fighters, um, the plow symbolized um, how Ireland could be self-sufficient if they were independent. 
um, that, and that they could be independent and free from the plow to the stars. So I um, encourage you to check out other cultures, uh, star knowledge and stories about um, not only the Big Dipper and um, the bear or plow or wheels, but other constellations in the night sky, um, either through your own research, um, talking to people in your community or using the, uh, the Stellarium website or the Stellarium desktop program. So with that, thanks for, for tuning in. I hope you, we were able to orient you in the night sky using Stellarium. Um, but I'd like to hand it off now to Emily Debert. She's going to take us one step deeper. Um, Emily is a PhD candidate in astronomy at U of T, where she studies the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars. She's going to show us in the real sky many of the things we just saw in Stellarium. Take it away, Emily. Thank you so much, Michael, and hello everyone who's joining us from all over the world. Um, I was looking in the chat before we started and I saw that we have people from all across Canada, from the US, from Mexico, so really glad to see you all here. Um, as you just heard, my name is Emily and I'm an astronomer at the University of Toronto. I'm really excited to be with you here today and to show you some real live views of some of the objects that Michael just introduced us to. Um, so now while we're going to be looking at these objects through some telescopes from our friends at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, um, all of the objects that we're looking at in this particular segment are things that you can see yourself with your naked eyes. So if it's dark out where you are, if it's not too cloudy where you are, I definitely encourage you to head outside or maybe even go to a window and take a look for yourself. Um, if it isn't dark yet, we will show you how to find all these objects in the sky so you can definitely go see them later on. Um, I also encourage you to take photos of anything you're seeing throughout the night and share them with us on social media. Uh, we are at Dunlap Institute on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you share your photos with the hashtag Planet Party, you'll be entered into a contest to win a really cool Dunlap t-shirt. Um, but that's enough of, from me for now. I know you're all here to look at the night sky. So without further ado, let's go over to Michael Williams, who is the Campus Observatory Director at the University of Toronto. Hi, Mike. How are the skies looking right now? Uh, hi, Emily. Um, there's quite a bit of high cloud uh, in Toronto, um, but we can still see a fair amount. Um, so I'm actually in the uh, physics tower on the St. George campus. And on the roof of that physics tower, we actually have a camera that looks up at the night sky and just broadcasts the, uh, an, an image of that sky. Um, so these are called all sky cameras. Um, so now we're looking at a view of the night sky above uh, the physics tower. Uh, and so just to orient you, um, this way is south. Uh, there's a big smokestack on campus. If you've ever been on the St. George campus, that's just right. south of the physics tower. Uh, and then north, uh, east, and west. Um, uh, so Michael talked about the Summer Triangle, and the three stars in the Summer Triangle are Vega, Deneb, and Altair. So there's the Summer Triangle. Um, and uh, so you can find that in the sky. Uh, so those are three stars that are very, very easy to find, even in the middle of downtown Toronto. Uh, now, the fourth brightest object in the sky is the planet Jupiter, which right now is hiding behind our radio dish. Um, but even through the radio dish, we can see it. Um, and then the planet Saturn is here. So the second uh, and, the, and, the, and the third brightest objects are actually also visible, but not on our all sky cameras. So that's the moon and Venus, which are uh, way in the west here. Uh, all right. So if you're at home right now and you don't have a radio dish in the way, you can probably <laughs> see those planets down on the southern sky. Um, Mike, could you tell us a bit about how people can know that they're looking at a planet and not a star, maybe? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, the atmosphere tends to make stars twinkle, um, especially when they get closer to the horizon. Um, but planets, because they're sort of resolved objects, uh, they actually don't twinkle in the sky. So. Mm -hmm. If you find a really bright thing like Jupiter and it's not twinkling, um, then it's probably a planet. Great, thanks. 
Um, so we will come back to Mike in a bit, uh, but we have a few other views of the sky that hopefully aren't quite as cloudy. Um, so let's hop over right now to Chris Vaughn and Dennis Gray, who are RESC members. Um, they're 150 kilometers north of Toronto in Collingwood at the Carr Observatory. So Chris and Dennis, how is it looking there? Hi, Emily. It's uh, Dennis here. It's, uh, it's nice and dark, but uh, we've got a strong wind up here. Okay. <laughs> So if, if it's a bit windy there, maybe we can uh, we can come back in a little bit uh, if we can't see anything right now. We're we're ready to go. It's just okay. You just ask how is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what can we see right now? Do you want to see the um, wide view first? Yeah. Let's take a look at the wide view. So this All is right. going to be uh, similar, maybe, to what Mike was showing us, but hopefully not quite as cloudy. Here we go. Hopefully everyone can see this coming through here in a moment. So this is a this is a frame I just shot a moment ago of the southern sky. You can see the moon is setting here in the southwest. Right. We've got Jupiter on the south left. And then at the top there, that there's a few bright stars. I'm going to zoom in so you can see these a little bit better. That's Altair, part of the summer triangle, which is handy. Oh, I think I just lost my connection. I can still hear you okay, and I can still oh. see it there. I can see the stars. My uh, my connection to my share screen uh, dropped away. So, yeah. So, and then you got to the due south, you've got the teapot shaped asterism of Sagittarius. And uh, then I'll, let's switch over and see uh, what, what uh, Dennis has got while I get my technology fixed up. All right. Hi, Dennis. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm looking at the uh, here we go. So hi there, I'm looking at the right now, and just give me a heads up that you can see it. Hopefully you can. Yep, I can see it coming through here, and that looks great. Great. So it yeah, does so look as windy, you can I tell, can see. <laughs> it is windy out yeah. here. So <laughs> just to give you some context, this is a this is a telescope that's on a mount that's uh, able to handle handle 300 pounds of telescope wow. and the wind is sufficiently strong here normally uh, a little breeze wouldn't cause this kind of shaking but because it's very bit windy here tonight we're getting a lot of stuff going on what i'm doing here is i'm zooming in on the moon and starting sort of at the northern uh, hemisphere here the northern tip of the moon and what we're looking at up here is kind of the uh, the north pole of the moon and one of the things you can see here, I don't know if it comes through on the video that well, but you see that little patch of light that's just sort of floating out there beyond the Terminator? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's one of the mountains near the North Pole of the Moon. And you may have heard oh, wow. that they've discovered water in, the, in some of those uh, shadowy craters that are at the North Pole that never see right. the sun. That's one of the mountains that's creating those conditions where there is some water uh, potentially in the soil up at that Northern Pole there. And oh, so wow. it's kind of cool to see that tonight. Uh, just, it just like I say, it, it's a little subtle, but you can see it floating out there. Yeah. As we kind of go down uh, towards the south, so we start our journey heading down uh, towards the south. One thing you'll see is, oh, well, there's some clouds. Hopefully they'll uh, move out of the way quickly enough. But you notice that the, the edge of the moon isn't perfectly uh, straight. And that's not just the fact that it's moving around a lot, yeah. but it's actually... We're seeing uh, mountains and hills and valleys uh, that are uh, essentially uh, on the edge of the moon there. And they are right. uh, just sort of popping up over the edge there. And it's giving us a sense of, of the, uh, the terrain we're looking at. Um, as we go down south, then you'll see there's a bunch of craters there. I mean, that's one of the big stories about the moon. The moon's surface has been pounded for billions of years by rocks of all shapes and sizes. And right. over time, um, there are craters, big craters, little craters, medium-sized craters. It's just craters, craters all the way down. And what you can see here are some of the very uh, various kinds. So if you look at some of these craters here, this one here at the top is probably about um, uh, 7,500 kilometers. Uh, here would be like 50, 100 kilometers. Um, so you can imagine like Toronto would probably kind of be in that bottom right-hand corner there. And 
Yeah, Ontario would be in really rough shape if if that was a crater in yeah. southern Ontario. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if we go down a little further still, um, you can see some of the more subtle features here. Do you, do you see this sinuous line here? It looks a little yeah. bit like a snake. So <clears throat> what that is, is that's a, 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 a geological formation that when the uh, that there was a huge impact basin there and it filled with lava and then it subsided. And so we oh, wow. brought this, uh, this ridge here, but you can only see that ridge because it's kind of like a, it's like a straight hill. It's like 30 feet high. You wow. know that ski hill they have in, um, in Mississauga that you go yeah. skiing on when you're a kid? Something like that. Like that. <laughs> but when the shadow is just right, as it is now, you can see it uh, coming out and it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Now this, this thing here we're looking at in the middle of the screen is uh, Mare Crisum, uh, the Sea of Crises. And this is one of the biggest craters that you can see. And when you look at the moon, you notice how there's a bunch of round, big round things on it, right? Those, yeah. are, those, are, those are impact structures as well. We don't call them craters, we call them basins because they're so, so. What's happened with these is they, the, a huge object came in, crunched through uh, the moon's surface, broke through the crust, and it filled with lava. So the reason it's so dark is that that's lava coming up from the interior of the moon oh, wow. and, and filling that, that entire basin with lava one or two or three kilometers thick. Um, after the basin happened, then you can see additional stuff that's there. Um, there are smaller craters that are inside the, um, the, the main uh, sea here, and you can even see that uh, there's a discoloration around that crater there. That's because it punched up darker soil from below. Uh, wow. So that's part of what we're seeing here. This, uh, we have uh, a viewer this... question here, actually, about your telescope, sure. if you don't mind answering. Um, they're wondering how big your telescope is to be able to see these really incredible views of the moon. Well, it's a 16-inch it's a telescope, um, but you could see these kinds of views with smaller telescopes, it doesn't have to be 16 inches. In fact, that's a pretty darn big telescope. Yeah. Uh, it's about the magnification factor. So what we're looking at here, the magnification is about 150 times. So you need a telescope that can take that much magnification without uh, having the image break down too much. Right. Um, and of course, uh, in this case, we're looking at a camera here that's uh, that's part and parcel of it. So, um, so just to continue my little guided tour here, so we. We go from the northern hemisphere down a little further, and hopefully the clouds will stay out of the way, and we get to the older part of the lunar surface. This is the southern part of the moon, and just looking to see, oh, oh we're losing it. But just before we lost it there, <laughs> um, the, the perils of being live, you could see yeah. much older terrain full of many, many craters and no of none of these big uh, mares. Though that... Um, uh, kind of terrain is the most ancient part of the moon, yeah. probably about four billion years old, sort of thing. So I think we might have just oh, it's just coming back. There it is. Okay, so we got uh, so just to highlight that again. So here down at the southern hemisphere, we are seeing lots and lots of craters, and it's really craters on top of craters on cuts on top of craters, and this is what they call saturation. So parts yeah. of the lunar surface have just been pummeled so much. There's really, uh, you can't make a crater without wrecking another one. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think we can try jumping over to Mike Williams to see if he's got a, a less cloudy view right now, maybe. Uh, hi, Emily. Um, hi, Mike. Unfortunately, I have it's a cloudy, much more cloudy view. Okay, that's okay. Um, so the slightly black screen is... Yeah, <laughs> all clouds. Like um, we have, okay, one other, we, we can check over with uh, Ian Wheelband, maybe, if it's not cloudy there. Ian's all the way over in Nova Scotia, um, so hopefully the weather is a little different there than it is here. Hi, Emily. Yeah, the Hi. weather's a little different. Um, it was mostly clear up until about a few minutes ago, but we're okay, so hang on and I'll, I will share my screen. Um, so, so this is a, a night sky view from my backyard, and it's facing sort of southeast. And it's using a, a digital SLR camera with a wide field of 14 millimeter lens on. So it's right. not capturing the, the broad expanses that Mike Williams and was showing, but um, and I, I couldn't see what Chris was showing, so I can't comment on that. But um, anyway, the, here here is Jupiter down near the trees and Saturn just above the tree there. Unfortunately, right. the telescope that I've got looking at Saturn is seated right about there right now. So I'll have to make, wait a moment. 
And you can see the Milky Way in the background there as well. Yeah, as, that's um, spectacular. Yeah, so, so so the part of the summer triangle, Michael, that uh, Michael Shea was talking about, the star here is Altair. That's the the bottom corner. Right. The of that, and the center of our galaxy is sort of hiding just behind the house, and um, and and so so that's the view. As you see, the clouds are moving off. This is a, a live view, and. You can also see a little bit of dew forming on my lens there as Jupiter starts yeah. to get that shadow around it. Um, you see the color difference between the, the clouds and the Milky Way. Yeah. Um, this is reflected light from Halifax. I mean, it's about a half an oh. hour away, but it's light pollution. And so that's the thing, the, the color of the light that goes up there. We have some filters that can block it out, but it does tend to wash away some stuff. I'm far enough that I can see the Milky Way, but sadly for you, right downtown Toronto, I, I don't think you'll be able to. Yeah, see. it's a, a totally different view down here. That's what I was yeah. just thinking. There's so many more stars that you can see there compared to Toronto. Um, although our viewers in Toronto should hopefully be able to see at least the planets, which we can see in your view are quite bright. They should oh, also think, be quite bright in Toronto too. I think they can indeed. Yeah, yeah. And the, the clouds will continue to clear, and I'll nip out after we finish talking and wipe the dew off. You see, it's really really starting to, to form quite quite a lot now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so maybe we can check back in with Chris and Dennis and see if they if it's clear, cleared up a bit there. Yeah, I've, I've actually got actually it's only the moon that has clouds on it. So oh, no. <laughs> let me start sharing my view. So here's a frame that I just, just took a moment ago. So there's the moon with the cloud that we're all gathering, vacuuming up all the clouds in the oh, sky. Oh, yeah, we can see the it there. Yeah. Not too bad. <laughs> Thin cirrus cloud. So I've got a satellite or an airplane or something going through the frame here. That's what that dotted line is. Oh, yeah. But you can see we're in the southeast. You've got Jupiter and Saturn. And if I zoom in. Oh, yeah, they're up, quite I bright. Can, yeah. I can tell there are any moons beside Jupiter, but they're quite bright. The little stars that are near Saturn, that's Capricornus. And oh, then wow. if I head into the middle, you can see the teapot-shaped stars of Sagittarius. There's the handle. There's a pointy spout, pointy lid. There's the spout, pointy spout, and then a flat bottom. And this is due south. It's hard to see from the city, but if you got down to the lake shore and looked south, you might have a chance of seeing it, especially with right. binoculars. Yeah. And uh, just for fun, the, the center of our Milky Way galaxy sits right about here in the sky. So if, oh, you're right wow. in, if you're away from the city and you've got a dark sky with the Milky Way, if you point your, your binoculars just above the pointy spout of the teapot, you're looking at the center of our galaxy. It's amazing. Wow. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, we will come back to everyone uh, later tonight. Um, but for now, thank you so much, Chris and Dennis, Ian and Mike. Um, um, we are, thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll move on now um, to our next section. Um, we have Julie bulldog Duval, who's going to talk about exploration of the moon. So we'll hear a bit more about what we were just looking at. Uh, Julie is executive director and founder of Discover the Universe which is a national bilingual team which trains teachers to teach astronomy. And you can find out more about Discover the Universe at discovertheuniverse.ca. Um, don't forget too, I know I saw in the chat, a lot of you were really excited about the games. So we will have games coming up in a bit. Uh, there are more prizes you can win at the games. Um, so you can open up kahoot.it if you are really stoked about that now um, and get ready to participate because we will have that coming after the moon talk. Hello everyone. I'm here to talk to you about the moon and more specifically moon exploration. Um, like many of you, I guess I was born knowing that we had been to the moon, like the Apollo missions happened before I was born. So I've always known that humanity had set foot on the moon. The last time was actually in 1972, so almost 50 years ago. And I've always been fascinated by the pictures um, the, from the Apollo missions because we can see a world that looks a bit like Earth, but is strangely alien at the same time. You know, you can see rocks and hills, and that looks similar to what we can see on our planet. But then you can see the black sky, yet the picture is lit. So you can see the sun is up in the sky, that the astronaut and the, the hills, the landscape is lit. Um, so it feels very weird to have this dark sky, and that's actually because there's no atmosphere on the moon. For me, the Apollo missions really gave us a view of a new world, completely different than what we're used to on Earth. Even seeing them walk, you can tell something is wrong. The gravity is not the same there, and it feels very different. But for almost 50 years, we haven't been back to the moon. 
astronauts do go up in, up in space, uh, but they go to the International Space Station, and that's really in low Earth orbit. To give you an idea of the scale, I'm going to use here my Earth and my Moon. Um, if I create a scale model, this is uh, how small the Moon is compared to the Earth, and I would need to put my Moon about two meters away from the Earth. Um, so going to the Moon is actually quite far. The International Space Station on this model is actually less than one millimeter away from my Earth ball here. Um, so the International Space Station, or in the astronauts, when they go in it, they're very, very close to the Earth. So that gives them a perspective of the Earth that's quite different than going to the Moon. And you can imagine the challenges are quite different as well. It's much further away. Um, going to the Moon also means that you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, so there's an extra protection that astronauts don't have. And the view the astronauts get is quite different. Uh, this is from the International Space Station. It's very close to the Earth, so you never see the Earth completely as a sphere because you're really, really close to it. Uh, still beautiful, though. In this case, you can see the southern lights, actually, the aurora uh, above the southern hemisphere, and you can see the Canadarm there quite well in the middle um, of the view. So this is the kind of view that um, astronauts get now. They're very close to the Earth. But going further away, you can actually see the entire Earth, our beautiful planet, um, as a sphere and sit completely. And this was a picture taken by the Apollo 17 missions. Now there's a new project to go back to the moon led by NASA with different partners, including the Canadian Space Agency. And one step for it will be to build the Lunar Gateway, a space station in orbit around the moon. You can see again a Canadarm here. This is Canadarm 3, the Canadian contribution to this big project. This Canadarm actually will be even more intelligent than the previous ones. There will be artificial intelligence included so that it can be autonomous for part of what it has to do. So it's a big project and it will serve as a lab um, to conduct experiments and also have closer access to the surface of the moon and really a gateway um, in terms of going to further into space. Um, so you can see again the Canadian contribution, Canadarm, we're really well known across the world for our space robotics expertise. So that's what we're contributing to the Lunar Gateway Space Station. And because of our contribution to Lunar Gateway, Canada will be part of the Artemis mission, which is to send humans back to the moon. Uh, Artemis 1 will not have a crew. Artemis 2 will bring astronauts in orbit around the moon and a Canadian astronaut will be part of that mission. So in the next few years, a Canadian astronaut will get to go around the moon in orbit. Won't land on the surface though. That will be the Artemis 3, where the next humans will set foot on the moon, including the first women to do it. So even though Canadian astronauts won't get to land on the moon, at least in the first three missions there, um, it will be interesting to see the pictures they bring back, their experience. They will live something that very few humans have lived, getting to see the Earth from far away, as we see here. And I know I'll be watching when Artemis 3 actually lands on the surface of the moon and astronauts are on the surface again. We'll have amazing footage of that. And since I missed the first time around over 50 years ago, I'll be excited to watch that one. Hello, everyone. I'm Ilana McDonald, and this is the moment you've all been waiting for, is our first round of Planet Party, uh, uh, Planet Party Trivia Quiz Game. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're going to have our first round of Planet Party uh, Games. Um, you're going to have a bunch of trivia questions uh, popping in. And in order to play along, you have to go to kahoot.it and uh, join with the pin that you can see on the screen right now. So uh, enter the pin 324698 into kahoot.it. Now, if you do want to win prizes, you need to put in your real email address. Um, and we promise that we won't contact you unless you've actually won some prizes. Uh, so uh, go to kahoot.it right now and put in your uh, username or your, <laughs> your email, uh, put in the pin here, and we'll get started with the games once a few more people have joined. Now uh, keep in mind that this is the first of two rounds on the stream. 
So this first round is going to have to do with the solar system. That's going to be the focus of our questions. And uh, the second round will be a little bit later, and I'll reveal the topic when we get there. Um, there's going to be uh, prizes for the top three winners of the evening, or of this round, I should say. And we'll do a random draw with one participant. Uh, so if you play, then you can win a prize as long as you put in your actual email address. Um, I'll just let a few more people uh, join. Wow, we've got already over 200 people uh, playing right now. Uh, I'll give you another maybe 30 seconds to join, but keep in mind that if you're coming in a bit later, uh, the game pin will still be visible at the bottom of the screen so you can still participate. So let's go with another maybe 10 seconds. So still so many people signing in, this is amazing. All right, let's get started. And keep in mind that if you're still joining in, you can still do so by entering the game pin, which is in the chat. Um, just go to kahoot.it, and it will also be at the bottom of the, the screen as we continue. So getting started, uh, we're going to be talking about the solar system in this first round of games. Um, before we get started, we should talk about the rules. Um, of course, Anyone can play, um, but unfortunately, we can only send prizes to people in Canada who are outside of Quebec. So sorry to those uh, in Quebec and outside of Canada, but, you know, still play along. So, um, keep in mind that if you have a PhD in astronomy, that you are not eligible to win prizes. So we um, recommend that you play anyway, just to test your knowledge. We just want to make sure that it's fair for everyone. Of course, if you are under this, please have your parents' permission to play. And if you want to receive a prize, you have to use your real email address on Kahoot. And once again, we promise not to contact you, except for if you're a winner and you are getting a prize. Um, as you've probably realized, you should probably keep the chat respectful and family friendly. Um, and if you want more information about that, you can see uh, YouTube's community guidelines. All right, let's move on from the rules and talk about the prizes you can win. Oh my gosh, there's so many cool things you guys can get tonight. So our first prize is a Celestron Cometron First Scope, which is a beautiful little telescope, great for beginners. Um, it's, you know, a, a beautiful guy that you can see lots of things with, including a lot of the things that we'll be showing you on the stream tonight. Um, the second prize is a membership for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which is really great as well. The prize is a neon Saturn nightlight, which would look really cool just hanging on your wall, being used as a light somewhere. You know, it's just a really cool little, little thing there. Um, <laughs> and then of all the participants, there will be a random draw for a Dunlap Institute t-shirt, which is a very cool design on it. All right, let's go on to our questions without further ado. So our first question is, what is the body in the solar system with the hottest average temperature? Is it Mercury, Venus, Jupiter's moon Io, or Mars? So which one of these uh, bodies in the solar system has the hottest average temperature? You have about uh, 10 more seconds to answer. Get those answers in. Uh, remember, the faster you answer, the more points you get. So let's so get those answers in as quickly as possible. All right, time's up. And it seems that many of you got the correct answer. It is, in fact, Venus. Now, a lot of you mentioned Mercury, because Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. Uh, so. You would think that it would be hotter, but because Venus has this very, very thick atmosphere, it actually is hotter on average than Mercury is, which is crazy because Mercury is closer to the sun. All right, let's look at our scoreboard. So far, Captain Badger is in the lead with both Purple Chicken and Gentle Jaguar in very close second and third place. Let's see if the rest of you can catch up in our next question. Where has life been discovered in the solar system besides on Earth? Has life been discovered on Mars, on Europa, which is an icy moon of Jupiter, on the moon, uh, that is the Earth's moon, or nowhere else in the solar system? So where has life been discovered 
in the solar system besides the Earth? So you've got about nine seconds left. Get those answers in. See if you can make it to the top of the scoreboard. And here we are, time's up. And most of you got the correct answer. In fact, nowhere else besides the Earth has, has um, life been discovered in the solar system. So there have been sort of hints that maybe there was some on other planets, but there's no definitive evidence uh, that life has been anywhere except for the Earth so far. Looking once again at our scoreboard, we have Kind Yeti who has moved to the top of the charts with Knowing Raccoon in uh, a close second. Let's move on to the next question. The night is still young, there's still lots of time to catch up. So which rocky planet in our solar system has the most moons? Is it Mars? Is it the Earth? Is it Venus or is it Mercury? So which of these rocky planets in our solar system has the most moons? Mars, Earth, Venus, or Mercury? About seven seconds left. And time is up. And most of you got the correct answer. Fantastic. Mars is, in fact, the uh, rocky planet in our solar system that has the most moons with two moons. So the Earth has one, Mars has two, and Venus and Mercury both have zero moons. Moving on uh, to our scoreboard, once again, Kind Yeti has maintained their lead. Excellent job. Our next question is, what do the atmospheres of Mars and Venus have in common? So are they both too thin to support life? Do they ha both have a runaway greenhouse effect? Could they both be easily modified to be Earth-like? Or are they both primarily composed of carbon dioxide? So what do the atmospheres of these two planets have in common? We've got about four seconds left. Three, two, one. Get those answers in. And once again, you are doing great, crowd. Uh, we've got 165 people who all answered that the correct answer that they are primarily composed of carbon dioxide. So Venus's atmosphere is very, very thick and Mars's atmosphere is very, very thin. But what they have in common is that they're both made of carbon dioxide. So Knowing Raccoon has moved into the lead. Excellent job. Moving on to our next question, which is the only planetary system in the outer solar system to have been visited by a human built lander? So which of these planetary systems in the outer solar system has been visited by a human built lander? Has it been Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune? Get those answers in. Remember the faster you go, the more points you get. So is the answer Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune? And once again, most of you got the correct answer, which is Saturn. So Saturn was visited by the Cassini probe a few years back, and it dropped onto the surface of its moon Titan, a lander called Huygens. And that is the only time that anything has ever landed on something in the outer solar system. Now, Knowing Raccoon has maintained their lead. Excellent job. We're getting close to the end here. Which heavenly body did composer William Herschel discover while he was comet hunting? So was it Uranus, Neptune, the asteroid belt, or Pluto? So which of these solar system objects, heavenly bodies, did composer William Herschel discover? Uranus, Neptune, the asteroid belt, or Pluto? And you've got about two, one, zero seconds left. And that was a bit of a tricky one. As it turns out, William Herschel discovered Uranus, which was the first planet in our solar system to have been detected or discovered using a telescope. Looking once again at our scoreboard, Space Crane has moved into the lead. Excellent job. There's still a chance for the rest of you to catch up, though. We have two questions left. This one is, what gas 
gives Uranus and Neptune their blue-green color? Is it helium, hydrogen, methane, or oxygen? So which of these gases gives Uranus and Neptune, uh, which are both very similar in color, that blue-green sheen that they both have? Helium, hydrogen, methane, or oxygen? And the crowd got it right. Um, we've got most people answering methfact, the gas that is present in the atmospheres of both of these planets, and that gives them that color, that nice blue-green color that you see. All right. Looking once again, Space Crane has maintained their lead, but many people are catching up. So answer this final question, and let's see how you all do. So true or false? Pluto is slightly larger than the Earth's moon. Is this a true statement or a false statement? Pluto is slightly larger than the Earth's moon. All right, you've got about 13 seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up on this final question. And most of you got it right, but there was a little bit of a split there. So in fact, Pluto is much smaller than the Earth's moon. It's about a thousand kilometers less wide than the moon is. So it's a pretty small, small body. So now we can see who the winners are. In third place, we have Polite Sphinx, excellent job. In second place, we have Excited Duck, and our grand prize winner in first place winning a Celestron telescope is Space Crane. Amazing job. Um, an amazing job to everyone who participated. We're going to be contacting the winners uh, via email. So if you put in your correct email, uh, wait to hear from us. Um, we will be, if you didn't put in your correct email, we'll go down the list to those who, who did. And of course, we're going to do a random draw for a Dunlap Institute t-shirt. Uh, for one of the participants who entered their emails. So now we're going to go on uh, to Karthik Iyer, who is a Dunlap Fellow um, who, whose research explores the history and origins of galaxies. And he's going to lead us in some uh, observing of Jupiter and Saturn. So over to you, Karthik. Awesome. Thanks, Alana. That was a fantastic quiz. So hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all having a wonderful time. I'm Karthik Iyer, a postdoctoral fellow at the Dunlop Institute, and I'm usually studying galaxies far, far away to figure out how they form stars. However, today I'm going to join all of you in looking at live images yeah. of Saturn and Jupiter, two of the biggest, most magnificent objects in our solar system that we already saw wide-angle views of earlier today. Uh, it continually blows my mind that we can see these planets billions of kilometers away with our naked eye. So regardless of where you are, if you have a clear sky, grab your phone, camera, binoculars, telescope, and head on outside to see these planets in the southern sky for yourself. And if you take pictures, uh, please post them and tag us on social media using at Dunlop Institute on Twitter or Instagram and post these pictures with the hashtag planet party for a chance to win a cool Dunlop t-shirt. So to start with, let's head over to Ian Wielman, who's outside in Halifax near Nova Scotia. Ian's going to be showing us a live view of Saturn close up, sixth planet in our solar system and iconic because of its distinctive icy rings. So Ian, thanks for setting things up. How is it looking over there? It's it's okay. Hi, Karthik. Like, yeah, it's looking okay. Uh, those clouds that were up high are a little down, down low, but uh, let me share the screen anyway. Um, right. If it goes really bad, I've, I've got a backup video. So this is Saturn, and unfortunately, you see the clouds fading in and out, but it's getting brighter and dimmer. The clouds are also ruining the view a little bit, but it's it's getting it'll get better. I'll try and describe it. So there's the planet disk, and you can see the rings around the. Uh, the edge, there's a, there's a few rings. If the clouds clear enough, we'll be able to see a fainter outer ring and a, and a smaller, uh, in, I mean, a fatter inner one. Um, there's also a, another line on the planet that, uh, uh, hang on, I'm going to change my view a little bit to try and 
adjust the camera, and I'm sorry for not looking at the screen, to the changing sky conditions. And, and it, uh, cause it, there, it's actually got a little better. But um, so, so there we go, uh, perhaps a little better. You can see Saturn's rings in front of the planet there um, and then going around behind um, the shadow of the, the planet itself on the rings. Right. Um, and th this is using a, um, a, an eight inch telescope um, that, that's magnified to give it, um, so eight inch, so 20 centimeters. Let me go, go in metric system, I guess. Um, and, and it's magnified to give it a four meter focal length, which gives it quite a lot of, of magnification on the sensor of the camera. So right. I'm able to, able to bring out a few more details. Um, this is the object that w when, uh, when I, I show people live, uh, kids of all ages, and I'm going to say kids from 8 to 80, who, who look at the telescope the first time and they go, oh my gosh, is it the real thing? And, and the other thing that happens is that kids of all ages, again, they'll, they'll finish looking at the eyepiece and they'll look down the telescope and go, well, where's the picture? Because, <laughs> because they think that, oh, there's got to be a picture somewhere. Well, no, it's live. And uh, this, uh, this indeed started my first um, uh, foray into astronomy. I, I found Saturn uh, with much difficulty when I was a, a, an early teen, and, and it just blew me away. I thought, wow, that's really cool. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit fuzzy for us, but perhaps better than, uh, better than it could have, could have been. Um, so yeah, Saturn, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful planet. Um, this view is a, it's about one, one billion four hundred million kilometers away right now. Uh, a little further than the moon. We looked at a little earlier. Um, uh, and and to give that that number a bit of sense, um, using light speed numbers. Um, light three hundred thousand kilometers a second goes around the Earth seven times in in one second reflects off the moon in just over one second um and it's been about about 80 minutes or so i think traveling from saturn to our eyes so that is a lot further than the moon and just wait till we go out to the stars and we'll get a lot further still i think chris fawn is going to talk more about the moons of saturn i can try and blow the image out a little bit and show some of those moons for him to chat right so let's let's go look at the the spectrum of Saturn that Mike oh. wants to show us, and then we could come back to the the moons. How does that sound? Perfect. All right, great. So this is amazing, and and it's blowing my mind right now as as a kid of thirty odd years. Uh, but let's let's switch over to Mike Williams at the the U of T campus observatory, who's going to show us a spectrum of Saturn. Um, yeah, um, and. So for people who don't know what a spectrum is, basically you can take the light um, uh, and spread it out into a rainbow and take a picture of that rainbow. So I can actually do this with my webcam as well. I have this um, thing which is called a diffraction grating, and it's going to take the light and spread it out into a rainbow. Uh, so this room is filled with uh, fluorescent lights. So you see those beautiful rainbows, but there's also those bright lines, uh, vertical lines in in some of those rainbows. Right. Um, and so those are called emission lines. Uh, so fluorescent tubes are filled with mercury vapor, um, and that mercury vapor only glows at very specific wavelengths, um, and it makes those emission lines. And then there's a special coating on the inside that, that sort of transforms that into a much broader light. Um, so unfortunately, it's cloudy here, so I can't show you a live uh, spectrum from Saturn. But I can show you one that I did a little while ago. Um, so uh, just to give you some context, uh, here is a picture of what Saturn looked like. So the spectrograph on the telescope uh, takes in light through a slit. Uh, so that's that little black um, line through Saturn um, rainbow. Uh, if you go uh, across the image, you're looking at different wavelengths of light. Uh, and this end, you're looking at red lights. And this end, you're looking at blue light. Um, well, actually, it's backwards. So this is red lights and blue light over on that side. Um, OK, OK. 
And but if you go up and down in the image, uh, you're actually looking at different parts of Saturn. Uh, so if you look at sort of the top above this line here, you're actually looking at the rings of Saturn. And if you look below this line here, you're looking at the rings again on the other side. Um, and then the bit in the middle is coming from Saturn itself. Um, so most of the light we see from Saturn is reflected light from the sun. Uh, and we see these black lines in different parts of the spectrum. Uh, so these are like those bright lines in the uh, spectrum from the fluorescent lights. And so these happen at very specific wavelengths for different elements. And you can think of it as kind of a fingerprint. Yeah. Uh, so this really dark black line here, that actually comes from the element hydrogen. Uh, so that's one way we know that there's hydrogen, at least in the atmosphere of, of the sun, is we can actually see this line and compare it to a hydrogen line that we can make in the lab. Um, so for the most part, all of these lines um, are lines that come from the sun's atmosphere. But if you look, there's these two big blocks where it gets very, very dim. And so there's a lot of light being absorbed here. But it only happens on Saturn. It doesn't actually happen in the rings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the rings are ice and they just mostly reflect the light back at us. Uh, but Saturn is a gas giant. And so it has an upper atmosphere. And so the light from the sun actually goes through part of Saturn, reflects back and comes back to us. So these big blocks of missing light are actually due to ammonia in the upper atmosphere of Saturn. Oh, so you can actually figure out that Saturn has ammonia in its upper atmosphere. Right. Uh, just by looking at the spectra. So that's one neat thing you can do with spectra is they help you to figure out what things are made up of. Uh, so the other thing you can do with spectra is you can actually figure out how fast things are moving, either towards you or away from you. All right. uh, and to do that, you need to use a much higher resolution spectra than here. So mm -hmm. I have spectrum from a different spectrogram. And it's just a tiny piece of the spectrum, about from here to about here. So it's just a tiny piece of that spectrum. All right. So we're kind of blown up. Um, and so again, everything under here are just the rings. Unfortunately, I cut the rings off on the top. So this is Saturn here to here, and then rings. And what you notice is these dark lines, they're actually sort of at an angle. They're not sort of vertical, um, but they're a little closer to vertical in the rings. And that's because Saturn is rotating. Um, so the top part of this is, is a part of Saturn that's rotating away from us. Mm -hmm. So the line is red shifted. It's moved more towards the red. Uh, you can think of it like a uh, uh, police siren or a train. As it moves towards you, it gets higher pitch. And then it goes to lower pitch as it moves past you and away from you. Um, and then so this, this edge of Saturn is actually rotating towards us. And we can actually measure the difference in the position of these two and figure out how fast Saturn's rotating. Um, all without going to Saturn or, or doing anything like that. Uh, so using spectra, we can actually sort of remotely figure out a lot of things that we would have thought we'd have to actually go there to figure out. This is incredible. Yeah, so some, some people in the YouTube comments were already talking about how uh, you can you can figure out the chemical composition of an object using its spectrum, but you've gone above and beyond that and also shown us how you can start estimating things like its current motion and speed. So this is fantastic. Yep. And great, this is amazing. So thank you. Uh, spectra are, are especially close to my heart since we also use spectra from telescopes in space to study distant objects like galaxies, which contain billions of solar systems like our own. But speaking of the solar system, uh, let's go to, to Chris Vaughan and Dennis Gray at the, the Carr Observatory near Collingwood, about 150 kilometers north of Toronto, who are going to show us a live image of Jupiter. Uh, fifth planet in our solar system, biggest and most stormy of the gas giants. So, <clears throat> Dennis, how, how are things looking for that? 
Well, I, I like that you mentioned Stormy because we're still we're still dealing with the wind here. But uh, uh, you can see here, um, I'm uh, showing you an image of Jupiter. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm I'm overexposing Jupiter here just to draw your attention to the moons. Mm -hmm. um, and the Galilean uh, moons are the four largest moons of Jupiter. Uh, they were the first uh, things to be discovered by uh, Galileo when he turned a, a, an early telescope onto Jupiter, and it helped to prove that, um, uh, or it helped everyone to understand uh, that the, uh, the Copernican system of uh, the galaxy here. So you can see fading in and out a little bit here, we're really wrestling with it. But if I just increase the uh, brightness here, you can see we've got all four. So there's this um, uh, Callisto, uh, we've got Europa and just Barely around the edge of Jupiter, it's hard to see, but it's there. Is Io the closest one, and it's coming around uh, behind there? So we've got all four moons of Jupiter. Now, if I stop overexposing Jupiter here, you can see some of the detail on the planet. Now, uh -huh. again, unfortunately, because of the the wind and everything, it's bouncing around a little bit. But you can clearly see the equatorial belt there, and I'm just going to go in a little bit, uh, ex uh, just bunch up the. Uh, mm -hmm magnification here and hopefully we can see it a little bit better but uh, yeah so you can see this large uh, equatorial belt here and that's uh, one of the major features of Jupiter is the north and south equatorial belts they're kind of a reddish brown color I'm showing some black and white tonight uh, but uh, you can also see other detail but again uh, I don't have the uh, the best view of Jupiter right now uh, I'm gonna just uh, while we're talking about Jupiter I'm just gonna See if I can throw this to Ian, yeah. uh, because I know he's got another camera on Jupiter, and I think that might have a better view. Ian, are you able to do that? Oh, uh, I was I was waiting on Saturn, but what I can yes. Do, I, no, no, no. Uh, if, if you if you want to go ahead, don't uh, don't mess around with things. Uh, okay. We'll, so, so so let me just interject for a second and just mention to folks that if you've got binoculars, you can pick out those four little moons beside mm -hmm. Jupiter tonight if your sky is clear or any night. It just happens that tonight the four moons are all to the to the left of the planet, to the east of the planet, except that Io is just about to pass in front of Jupiter's disk from our vantage point on Earth. And in the next little while, we're actually going to see the shadow of Io cast upon Jupiter's disk. Hopefully the sky, the sky stay clear for us and we'll be able to pick up that little black dot of Io's shadow, uh, I think, in about half an hour or so that should start becoming apparent so yeah and so on, on that note i did promise uh, the moons of saturn so ian if you want to show us that that would be great okay you know the, the way the skies go uh, uh -huh. sadly, sadly i can't <laughs> uh, I, can, mount, I can show you a simulation yeah but the, my mount will will drive right to the middle of the sky but it won't drive past and it was beeping at me saying uh, i'm getting too close so i've right. had to move so give me a couple of minutes and I, i'll i'll try and get on jupiter but uh i'll leave it back with chris for saturn yeah let me let me just uh let me just um make lemonade and we'll deal with the sky <laughs> yeah so what we'll do is here i'm just going to switch back to the stellarium that mike was showing at the beginning I happen to have a any size telescope, you can see the rings. It doesn't need to be a big giant telescope. Any little telescope will show the rings of Saturn. You can pick up some of the moons. And it has five or six or so moons that an that, uh, that, um, amateur can see in, in, a, in a good, tele decent telescope, especially the moon Titan, which is the one that tonight is below the planet. So if you can see on my screen here, I've got Saturn's rings are extending left and right. right. And then directly below, about one and a half ring widths is Titan. And we often talk about about the moons with respect to the widths of Saturn's ring. So Titan stays always within about five or six times the width of the ring, sometimes closer, but never farther than that. Okay. The other little moons you see here, Dione, Enceladus, Tethys, and Rhea, they stay within a, within a diameter or two. They're always tucked in close to the planet. But a Iapetus, the I-A-P-T-U-S moon that's way off to the right there, it gets about 12 ring diameters away. And Iapetus is amazing because it actually has a dark hemisphere and a bright hemisphere. And because all the moons in the solar system are tidally locked towards their planet, and they keep the same face towards their planet at all times, as the Iapetus moves from the western side to the eastern side of Saturn, so the left or the right, 
it actually goes bright and dim, depending on which hemisphere we're viewing it from. So those are a few things you can take a look at next time you get your telescope on Saturn. That's incredible. And and Titan's also been discussed so many times as, as a possible place for humankind to explore. So that's that's going to come up in a panel later on. Right. Let's start yeah. sharing that one. Here's my here's my my sky view. Still fighting clouds, but we've got, still got some view. All right, so let's go back to Ian for a bit. Okay, so I've got Jupiter now. Um, let me share that screen. Excellent. Um, and uh, Chris just talked to, come on, go, go computer. Never tell a computer you're in a rush. So, mm -hmm. so here, here's our friend Jupiter. And um, you can see all of the cloud belts you notice immediately that it's not round because it's rotating so quickly it's squished at the pole. Chris mentioned that Io was very, very close to the edge. Can you see the little brighter dot? There it is. Yeah, so just it's, it's it. yes. just about to go onto onto the planet disk and um and so there there we go. Um Jupiter bouncing around a little bit. It it's low in the sky, this particular apparition, and so we're seeing through a lot of atmosphere, but but uh, I think that's a pretty good view myself to, tonight. I mean, it's better than than probably the last four or five nights that I've looked at at Jupiter. Um, mm -hmm. So we locked out a, a little bit, yeah. even though we're, as Chris pointed out, we're fighting the clouds and all that that kind of stuff. Um, now, now Jupiter orbits once every ten hours, so every second or third night you can see the great red spot. So it happens that tonight we're not seeing it, but. You've got your telescope out over the next night or two, you might see the great red spot as well. Right. And the great red spot is this giant storm that's just been on the surface of Jupiter for hundreds of years. It, it really is incredible seeing yeah. that this is live. Sorry, uh, Ian, you were saying? Yeah, so uh, back, back to Jupiter's red spot, which unfortunately we can't see tonight. Um, a little bit of history for me on, on that red spot. Um, I've been looking at Jupiter, I said, you know, since a teenager, I'm going to sort of give away my age. So a little over 40 years, I, I've been looking at Jupiter. The red spot has not stayed the same for, for that time. Um, first seen by Galileo um, uh, 400 years ago um, and probably has been around much longer. But, but the red spot um, has gone from a really deep brick red um, and and blatantly obvious, even in a, the tiniest telescope I would use. Uh, a while there, maybe 20 years ago, it was a very, very pale salmon color, and it was difficult to detect even in a really good big telescope. Uh, now it's, 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 got, it's got smaller now, too. It's probably two-thirds the size it was when I first started looking at it. And, and it's, um, um, it, it, the color is, has, has condensed a little bit, and it's a little bit more of a red spot that you can see more easily. Perhaps not in a tiny, tiny scope, but uh, certainly in something with, with a 10 centimeter diameter. So that's a, that's a relatively small amateur scope. You can see it. So that, that's a little bit of stuff about the great red spot. The other thing I'd want to mention about if you ever get back to look, really looking through a telescope is it, it, you can see it in this view here how um, we, we've all had, had the, the planets that show um, a somewhat blurry image, and then all of a sudden for a few seconds it'll go super clear. Kind of, and if you watch Jupiter right now, it's doing that. And and that's the sort of be patient at the eyepiece kind of trick is that somebody gives you a look through the eyepiece, say, oh, may I look for a minute or two, please? And they're going to say yes, because our astronomers know that you wait for those good few seconds of seeing out of every minute or two, and, and you can see way more detail in, in that time frame. Um, I'll often get a pencil and paper and, and draw something like this. And in those few moments of good seeing, you see so much more than, than if you just have a quick look and go, oh, wow, that's nice. Next. So be patient and stop and wait. So anyway, I'll, I'll shut up and let Chris talk some more and, uh, and, um, so, and enjoy the Jupiter view as long as you want. Awesome. So thank you so much for the wonderful advice. And thank you to Ian, Mike, Chris, and Dennis for the wonderful treats. Uh, we'll now be hearing from Chris Vaughn about the exploration of Jupiter, after which we'll have a, a panel on space exploration. Following that, we'll have a second round of quizzes. So please grab your phones and head on over to kahoot.it if you want to be ready to participate. Thanks again and have a great night.
All right, let's spend a few minutes talking about Jupiter's moons. So Jupiter is a massive planet, 318 times the size of Earth's mass, and it orbits five times farther from the sun than we do, once every 12 years. In fact, it's so massive that it's actually accumulated a whole bunch of small bodies that have now joined its group of moons and have also been uh, herded into groups at the, the uh, Jupiter-Sun Lagrange points, namely the Trojan asteroids, the, um, the Greeks, and the Hildas. At the present, we think Jupiter has 79 satellites. Four of them are tiny little moons that orbit close to the globe of the planet. But the four big ones are the ones we see from Earth. Those are the ones that Galileo discovered in 1610, plus countless irregular ones making up the total. So the Duke, Galileo discovered those moons using this little spyglass 40 millimeter aperture telescope back in 1610. And by observing them night after night, he was able to determine that they were orbiting the giant planet. Now, the, the four Galilean moons are really interesting. They orbit at different distances from Jupiter, and that has caused them to experience different amounts of tidal heating. And when you heat up an object that's actually composed of a mix of rock and ice and other volatiles, it allows it to differentiate. The heavy material falls to the center, and the lighter material flows to the outer, outer side. So here we have the four Galilean moons in order. We have Io, which is closest. So Io has a density, a bulk density of 3.5 grams per cubic centimeter, and that's very close to the Earth's moon, which is here, 3.35. You can see that it has a, um, a molten uh, uh, iron core, iron-rich core, followed by a molten mag um, a mantle, similar to what Earth would have, and then a crust, uh, basically a hard surface crust. Next up, we have Europa. So Europa has more water in its mix, so more ice and more water, which means its density is lower, only at three. And it again has the iron-rich core, a rocky shell around that, and then what we think could be a subsurface liquid ocean surrounded by an icy crust. Up next is Ganymede. Ganymede is um, even more water-rich because it's further from the planet, it's been heated less, less of the water has escaped, and so it has its iron core, rocky shell, much more of a slushy, uh, icy mantle, and then a thick icy crust on the outside. Callisto is different. So Callisto hasn't experienced very much tidal warming, and so it hasn't had the time to differentiate the different groups of, of elements. So it's really more of a mixture of, of the ice and the um, ice and rock. And you can see that the densities of Ganymede and Callisto are considerably lower, 1.9 and 1.8. Now, one by one, Io is the uh, most interesting um, moon because it's so geologically active. It's uh, experiencing such tidal stresses that it has volcanoes. It's got a very young surface that's been reworked recently, so there are very few impacts uh, visible on it, impact sites. And this is a picture of a volcano that's erupting that was taken by the New Horizons mission in 2007. Europa is the smoothest round known world in the solar system. It's made up of a mix of silicate rock with an iron core and all the, the crust on the outside, the icy crust, that has been stained with organic molecules. It's actually famous for having um, plate tectonics on its, ice, on its ice plates, so that's one thing that we want to study. Now, could there be life on Europa? So magnetism suggests that underneath the icy crust, there's this liquid global saltwater ocean. When you put fresh water in contact with rock, it produces salt water, and the salt water acts as a conductor, which has allowed us to detect it through the, magnet, through the magnetism of its interaction with Jupiter's magnetic field. Now that crust is between 10 and 100 kilometers thick, so wouldn't it be great if we could send a submarine to sample that water and see if there's any life under there? Well, that's an awful lot of, light, a lot of, awful lot of ice to get through. So we have good news though. In 2013, the Hubble Space Telescope imaged Plumes or geysers erupting out of cracks in Europa, 200 kilometers up in the air, up into space, at an, um, a rate of seven tons a second. So instead of having to land, maybe we just fly a spacecraft at low altitude through those plumes and take a taste or a sample. Ganymede's next up. It's the largest moon in the solar system, bigger than even Mercury, but it's only half the mass because it's got so much ice inside of it. It has a small magnetic field produced by a dynamo inside it, and it may even have an onion sort of structure of, of, of shells. Finally, Callisto. Callisto is the farthest from Jupiter, less stresses. It's very much more inert than the other moons are, and uh, it's got a very old surface that hasn't been reworked, so we see um, craters, craters on there and frost patches and things like that. So how are we exploring Jupiter? Well, we've had a number of missions in the past. Right now, there's a mission called Juno in orbit around Jupiter. It's orbiting Jupiter's poles, every 53 days 
It swoops in very close to the planet and then spends a lot of time farther away from the planet to avoid those intense magnetic fields from Jupiter. It's designed to use magnetometers and gravity tools to measure the interior structure of Jupiter and to understand better its composition, its structure, and its magnetic field. What's coming up, though, is the European Space Agency is sending the JUICE mission. The Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer will launch in 2022 and arrive in 2031. This one is actually going to orbit Ganymede and study Ganymede's icy crust. It'll also have instruments on there to analyze the ocean layers that might be underneath, the surface topography, the internal structure, and, and it has a little bit of an atmosphere around Ganymede, so it'll look at that. But it'll also be taking a look at Europa, so it'll look at those organic molecules on Europa's surface. It'll use a radar system to penetrate up to nine kilometers deep into the icy crust and do a couple of very close flybys of, the, of that moon. The NASA Europa Clipper mission is, is, is um, scheduled to launch in 2024 and arrive in 2030. It's going to do some very close flybys of Europa while it continues to orbit the main planet Jupiter, down to 20, at least 25 kilometers above the moon's surface. It'll be looking at possible habitability of Europa and re do reconnaissance for a future lander on that moon. It'll, re it'll produce images that are 50, 50 meters per pixel resolution, really high resolution pictures of the surface, and map all that topography, the crust, the chemistry, and those possible you know, plate tectonic uh, effects that are happening on that. Um, it may be able to get a chance to fly through one of those plumes. It may deploy some CubeSats into orbit, and it will probably have another radar system that will let it to um, probe the depths of the ice crust. What's next? Well, China is planning to launch a mission called Gandu in 2029. It'll arrive in 2035, and it's going to study Jupiter's magnetism and the plasmas around associated with that. And it may even go into orbit around Callisto, which will be really interesting. And Russia's announced that it's producing a space tug spacecraft called Zeus. And that's actually going to start by visiting the moon, go off to Venus, and then make a trip out to Jupiter all in one trip. So maybe one of us will be around to step, set, set foot on uh, Jupiter's, one of Jupiter's moons one day. Let's hope. All right, thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Amanda Cook. I'm so excited to be joining you all to talk uh, to moderate a panel about the ethics of space colonization. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto, and I do radio astronomy mostly. So I like to study fast radio bursts, which are mysterious signals coming from very distant galaxies. Tonight, we have three guests joining us to discuss the increasingly urgent issue of the ethics of the colonization of space. Ambitious new entrants into the realm of human spaceflight, including corporations such as SpaceX and countries such as China and India, are sparking a new race to send humans back to the moon and beyond. There are many good reasons to send humans to space, from inspiring generations of young people to pursue careers in science to ensuring the long-term survival of our species. But there are also reasons to be cautious. For example, there's growing awareness of the problematic history of colonization on Earth, as well as our neglected responsibilities to take care of our own planet. So from an ethical standpoint, should humans go to space? If so, who should go and where? Who gets to decide? Tonight, we're joined by three scientists who each have their own takes on these questions. Dr. Hilding Nielsen is an assistant professor of astronomy at the University of Toronto, where he studies how to solve. He's also the creator and instructor of several courses in indigenous astronomy. Dr. Bharavi Shankar is a planetary scientist whose expertise in remote sensing and visualization has enhanced art of the surfaces of the Moon and Venus. She's a member of the Toronto Centre chapter of the RASC, and the founder of Indus Space, which provides educational programming to make space science and exploration more equitable. Finally, Dr. Josh Spiegel is a Dunlap Fellow whose research focuses on using advanced statistical techniques to understand how everything from our Milky Way galaxy to the universe as a whole has formed and has evolved. So we have a bunch of questions that we gathered from you all um, in advance on social media, but I'll just let you guys know that if you have any burning questions while we discuss, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and if there's anything that we really like, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a chance to maybe read those off. So let's start with an opening question for the entire panel, which is very simply, should humans go to space? Um, so Dr. Dr. Nielsen, can we maybe start with you? Sure, uh, thank you for having me. I think, sure, humans should go to space. It's, humans are not 
naturally explores. Uh, most every culture has explored and traveled around the world. Why not go to space? And by going to space, we get to learn about great things about the moon, the sun, uh, supernovae, gamma ray bursts, and, and, and you know, and things like that. So, I think going to space is a very valuable thing for humanity to do. Absolutely. And and Josh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, you know, one other way to think about this is a lot of times, you know, we've been doing a lot of astronomy tonight, and one way to look at this is why sort of look at and try and study space at all, given sort of the questions we have on Earth. And I think one of the uh, you know, intangible benefits of really pursuing space exploration and trying to learn more about space is the ways that it helps us sort of uh, learn about ourselves and better understand where we fit into everything. Uh, you know, astronomy and space exploration is really tied into a lot of, uh, you know, changes in how, you know, we really see how we fit into our place here on Earth and also how the Earth fits into the solar system and our, and our galaxy. And I think pursuing space exploration has a lot of benefits there. Absolutely. And, and Dr. Shankar. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, anything that we've tried um, when exploring space, we have actually ended up then using it right here on Earth. So there's a lot of potential in um, uh, making that uh, purpose actually become more beneficial to us on, as humans. So I also agree, space exploration is um, needed and, and continues to inspire us as um, STEM professionals. So really, that's uh, key. Absolutely agree. And so let's let's circle back to uh, Dr. Nielsen. So what are your thoughts on the ethics of terraforming Mars? Yeah, you know, Mars is the red planet and it's very different than the Earth. We can go there and we can try to change the surface of the planet and make it more hazardous for us. But is that the right thing to do? You know, we haven't confirmed whether or not Mars has or has not has no life. It still may. It could be under the surface. It could be in, in the poles. It could be other pla places we haven't really explored in detail. So terraforming Mars right now is, is dangerous in that respect. But, you know, I think from uh, a perspective of humanity and living in North America, which, which is indigenous land, we should be aware that we've been terraforming for centuries. The, when the settlers and colonizers first came over, they brought animals and plants and changed the landscape and the waterscape all, all around North and South America. And in doing so, have caused significant harm in a lot of cases to different to species of animals that are native and indigenous to lands here, change how uh, different plants grow and evolve. And so even on Earth, just that terraforming in places where it's easy, we haven't really done a very good job. So it's not clear that if we go to Mars and try to terraform it, that we're not going to just mess it up either. You know, we like to think of terraforming as this great thing for humanity, but we don't necessarily know even if we can do it right or properly. And I think my final thought on this is, you know, we talk, there's been a lot of discussion recently about uh, whether rivers and mountains have rights of their own. And that we don't spend much time thinking is about the fact that do we have a right to go to Mars and actually terraform it? Does Mars have its own right to exist in its own way? Because we don't know what Mars is going to be like in a billion years from now. It may actually evolve life if, uh, in different ways. It may change on, from, from collisions with asteroids or comets, perhaps who knows. So do we have a right to impose our will on, on another planet? Absolutely. Oh, that's a that's a different perspective than we're mo used used to, and a very important one. Uh, so thank you for that. And so so we'll go to Dr. Spiegel next. Um, so currently, space is the purview of very few privileged humans, with capitalism and nationalism being the main systems we use. How do we prevent earthly social inequities from following us into space? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's it's really challenging. I mean that sort of has been the system that's been used for exploration and colonization for hundreds of years, um, you know, especially for, for many people here in North America. Um, and I think it's almost certain that's going to fall, fall off the space. I mean, I think the only, uh, you know, path forward that uh, really needs to take place is for there to be a lot of international cooperation, um, especially around lots of issues in space. Uh, you know, space exploration, you know, starts out with really having uh, the capabilities to have facilities in low Earth orbit on the moon. We've just talked about Mars. 
uh, you know, having sort of a lot of comprehensive international agreements guiding sort of cleaning up space debris, how exactly those places should be developed, uh, really, I think, is key. So cooperation, I think, is really the, uh, you know, the name of the game here. And that should be what a lot of uh, countries are pushing for over sort of this individual, you know, every nation and every company for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Shankar, um, how do we convince NASA's administrators that humans should stay home until industrial robots have totally constructed subsurface habitats and biospheres? Um, I'm not quite sure that we have to have that happen in that order. Um, in, I mean, if, if anything, it's a bit of uh, testing with robotic innovations and and um, expertise before you decide you want to send the humans over because it is valuable resource to send a person you want to ensure that the moment that they go out there they're doing what is asked or expected and and sort of you know needed in terms of the purpose of the project but yes you want to make sure that everything else as much as possible has been done ahead of time um, in terms of determining any um, um, dangerous areas if something is explorable or not um, but at the same time so which is what is happening right now anything that you look at in space exploration has been robotic after say the moon missions and and to uh, but but you also have the international space station as an opportunity to help humans understand what to expect how to adapt um, for that moment when they have to uh, perhaps explore outward so um, yeah, I think it's it's in a collaborative effort of the technologies and human exploration preparations. Totally, thank you so much. And so let's go back to Dr. Dr. Nielsen. Um, so one of our commenters on social media wants to know, will we take our wars to space? Do you have any thoughts on that? It's a very good question and something we really have to think about. Um, I think the development of the quote unquote space force in the US is probably one of the first signs that we're seeing of the militarization of outer space. Uh, and we're, we're going to see more of this through with, with, the, with our de dependence on sa satellites and satellite technology, with the, mil with the military and in terms of navigation. And, and we should be very concerned that this could happen. I'm a little more optimistic in the way that we seem to be fighting wars in the last 20 years. The main space uh, Sparing countries like China, the US, India, Russia, they don't really compete, compete head to head. You know, we, we've never had a, a serious war between world powers in a long time. So I'm somewhat optimistic that we won't, but it is something we really have to be, be concerned about happening. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's an interesting perspective. Thank you so much. And so, Dr. Spiegel, um, what are the financial demands of the quest to send humans to space? And are there financial benefits to going to space as well? Or is it just cost? Oh, that's an excellent one. Um, I think the, the presence sort of of multiple startup companies, including, uh, you know, for example, Jeff Bezos's recent trip to space uh, indicates that there are quite a lot of potential benefits. Um, I think the the biggest ones uh, have to do primarily with resource uh, resource extraction. Um, so things like getting uh, minerals, water in particular from things like comets uh, is one of the main reasons that's motivating a lot of these uh, sort of space mining startup companies to really pursue space exploration. The costs are pretty immense though. Um, you know, a lot of what companies like SpaceX have done have reduced substantially the cost of sending things into space, but the ability to sort of keep humans in space to build robots that can you know, operate on long time scales. If we're talking about terraforming, those costs are huge. Um, and so the investments in infrastructure that would be needed to accomplish lots of these is definitely still a ways off in the future. Very interesting. Absolutely, thank you so much. And and so uh, I, I'll take a question from the chat now. Uh, it's an interesting one. And so if there's anyone who is a uh, wants to take it, feel free to let me know. Um, so I guess when we were talking about um, protecting life and, and the rights of other life, who decides what extra extraterrestrial life is? Do you guys have any any uh, insight on that question? I think that is a million dollar question of what is life in general. Um, you know, we have a lot of definitions for what life is. And it's all based on our experience on Earth. And for almost every definition we have, 
there's usually a character example that breaks the definition and we still consider life. Uh, we can ask question, is a virus alive? It replicates, it, does, it, it uh, consumes and uses fuel, but it only exists because it depends on, on another species. So it doesn't exist on its own. And so we can ask questions, of, uh, lots of questions about really what is life. And I think we're probably not really going to, to know unless it's something we can recognize directly from Earth, like extreme files on Earth, whether they're, uh, you know, anaerobic, like don't consume oxygen, or the chemical reactions at the bottom of the ocean. And if you see something like that on, say, Europa, we can easily and readily identify it. But, you know, I keep, I think of the uh, Star Trek The Next Generation episode, early episode, way long ago, where they go to this planet and find the silica life form. And it's basically uh, just a microbe that lives in, in a layer of saline water. And they don't recognize it as life because it's silicate. And I'm not sure that we will recognize life if it's that, if it's that different. Yeah, that's yeah. It's definitely on all of our minds. Thank you for thanks for giving your insight on that. And so another another question that I'm seeing in the chat is: uh, Does space exploration warrant a collaborative effort from different countries of the world, or will an individual approach be more effective, uh, or sorry, more productive or competitive? Um, I don't know. Maybe, does anyone have an opinion on that? Um. I can, I can chime in. I think uh, if anything, what we've seen in the last about 20, 30 years of space exploration is that it is very much uh, a collaborative effort and it's becoming more. So it's not just one or two or three um, space agencies taking uh, ownership or lead. In fact, uh, there's a lot of um, collaborative um, um, efforts, initiatives, and and you know positives that come from that because they're no longer competing on trying to answer similar questions. The you know long the everlasting questions of are we alone in this universe, etc. It's rather becoming okay. Where can we share our resources for the greater good of space exploration? And if anything, the International Space Station is a I think a really good example of how that collaborative effort has. Um, has happened and it continues to grow and now future decades of exploration is always taking that international approach. Absolutely. Yeah, we are we are very proud in Canada of our Canadian arm. I know that I know that's a source of great pride for many of us. OK, so uh, let's let's grab another one, um, I guess less on the ethics, but more just on uh, curiosity about space space settlements. So maybe it maybe Josh, we can send this one to you. Are there any novel promising renewable energy sources sources which could potentially power space settlements for a long period of time? Ooh, that is an excellent question. Um, so I think the no brainer that always exists is uh, solar power. Um, but sort of, I guess the question wants to know if there's any possible other sources there. Um, I think one of the, uh, this depends a lot because the sort of renewable, the types of things you can use as renewable energy depends a lot on the local sort of ecosystems and processes that are taking place. So the options you might have on say Venus or Mars may be very different if you're on say Europa or Titan. Um, but we already know that several moons, for example, of Jupiter and Saturn have their own versions of water cycles or giant ices, and that might provide uh, novel sources of uh, being able to harness, you know, different types of hydropower, um, you know, on far off moons, especially because the further out you go from the sun, sort of the, the less bright it is. Um, and of course, that means you have solar power tends to be less efficient. You don't have a lot of atmosphere often. So wind is, uh, tends to be uh, more challenging. So harnessing these types of new energy sources uh, could be very fruitful. So one other thing I could mention is also the possibility of using some ge ge geothermal power. Um, a lot of moons on, say, Jupiter or Saturn, uh, you know, have sort of thermal tides. And uh, due to actual the expansion and contraction of the moons based on their orbit, and it is possible to possibly harness that energy source too. Oh, that's really interesting. And and Josh, could you see like benefits um, for our own planet if we put a lot of effort and resources into into making these renewable energy sources for other planets? I think the um, one of the benefits might be in terms of just uh, the types of challenges we'd have to overcome to develop technology there uh, could definitely have benefits here on Earth. Um, it's also possible that being able to produce energy elsewhere and sort of send it back either in something like, you know, giant batteries, uh, you know, could also help to alleviate a little bit of the pressure that we currently put on our own sort of local ecosystems 
uh, since we, we currently are taxing a lot of our own renewable energy resources right now, even though we should be doing more. Absolutely. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and so I see a lot of people in the chat wondering about legality. So who gets to govern and enforce international space related laws? Is Are there treaties related to space? And and some people are asking if, if I wanted to go to Mars, would I need a visa and who would decide? Um, do any of you guys have experience with, uh, with I guess, space laws? <laughs> um, I, I can't, oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry to speak over you. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, right now there's the new uh, Artemis Accord, which is a international treaty for the exploration of Mars in space, which has uh, items for protecting protecting parts of the moon, for instance, from from usage. Uh, historically, it was called historically significant sites, and we have space. There are space treaties going back to what the 60s or so uh, with the United Nations, which in principle should govern. Uh, a lot of our work in space. In terms of ownership in space, it's sort of like uh, the Antarctic where there is no right to claim a jurisdiction. So even though the US took a flag to the moon, it doesn't make the moon American. Uh, and, and likewise in other places. I think the problem comes down to is if a, one country wants to build a station and plant a flag and say, Mars is now this country's, a property, there's probably not a whole lot that's going to happen. But we have the laws there's, and a lot of laws, but there's no real um, rules around enforcement. That, and so enforcement will come from other countries sort of protesting and and maybe uh, doing embargoes or sanctions. But yeah, in the end, it's a little bit like the Wild West, which is also why this is a very colonial issue. That and I think this is also why it's a cap, partly capitalism is very entranced with this, like SpaceX and and other companies, because the law, the laws and the regulations are so unclear and so lenient. That it's very it's a lot easier for them to go in space and control and to make money. And so we really need to improve uh, space laws, and there are a lot of academics around the world working on this. But it's I think it's early days, and we're playing catch up with the. Uh, with the companies that are going up in space now. Oh yes, absolutely interesting. Okay, well that's phenomenal. Um, I know I know we have to move on because everyone's so excited about our games. But I am so thankful for this the panelists tonight. I know I learned a ton, and it was great to see everyone's interests and and uh, your comments in the chat. So yeah, thank you again to all the panelists. That was incredible. And we'll we'll pass off to Alana now uh, for Kahoot. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. And the moment that the rest of you have been waiting for uh, is our second round of games. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, a note, I know that some of you won some prizes in the first round. And I should note that you will not be eligible to win prizes in the second round if you already won prizes in the first round. So just to make it fair for us to be able to give enough prizes to as many people as possible, those are the rules. So if you would like to play in this second round of games, please go to kahoot.it, put in the game pin 6411179, and uh, please put in your actual email address. Uh, if you do not put in your actual email address, we will have no way to contact you if you did in fact win a prize. Um, so. Uh, we promise not to contact you for any other reason except for to let you know that you've won something. Um, so please do put your actual email into Kahoot. So we've got a lot of people joining in here. That's amazing. So our second round of games, uh, we're going to do about space exploration and colonization. How uh, <laughs> appropriate, given the panel we just listened to. So. Um, one note while we're waiting for uh, more people to join here is uh, that we can give prizes in uh, all of Canada uh, except for Quebec and we cannot mail prizes to outside of Canada unfortunately um, and uh, yeah 
And so if you're just joining us now, please go to kahoot.it, put in the game pin you see there. I'm just going to wait a couple more seconds for more people to join in. Uh, we've got a lot of people participating. This is amazing. And of course, if you won a prize in the first round, then you are not eligible to win a prize in the second round, unfortunately. Um, but you're welcome to participate as much as you'd like. All right, let's give it another 10 seconds for a couple more people to join. But if you uh, are uh, joining late, then there will be an opportunity. You just enter the game pin, which should appear in the chat at some point, And it'll also be visible at the bottom of the screen. All right, so another five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. And let's get started. All right. So as I said before, our second round of questions for the Planet Party trivia will be on space exploration and colonization. So uh, I'm going to put up the rules once again. If you, uh, anyone can play, of course, but we can only send prizes to Canadian addresses outside of Quebec. So sorry, Quebec. Sorry, those who live outside of Canada. Um, our trivia contests are aimed at the general public. So if you have a PhD in astronomy, unfortunately, you're not eligible to win trivia prizes, but you're still welcome to participate, of course. If you're under the age of 18, you have to have your parents' permission to play. Once again, you have to put your real email address into Kahoot. And uh, as before, keep the chat respectful, family friendly, uh, be kind to each other, all that fun stuff. And now, what you've all been waiting for are prizes for round two. So our first prize is probably the most impressive and expensive prize that we've ever given out at any of our events. And it's this Celestron Nexstar 4SE computerized telescope, a beautiful little scope uh, that's completely electronic. And it's, it's really easy to use, really easy to set up, and you get a great view of the sky with it. Our second prize, just like in the first round, is a membership to the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And our third prize is this really, really cool Chime Lego set. So that's, this is a Canadian radio telescope and you can build your own at home if you win one of these Lego sets. And anyone who participates will be eligible for a random draw for our Dunlap Institute t-shirt, which is very, very nice. All right, let's move on to the questions. Our first question of the night, approximately how many active satellites are currently in orbit around the Earth? Is it 3,400, 6,500, 7,200, or 11,100? How many active satellites are currently in orbit around the Earth? These are all very large numbers, but which of these large numbers is the correct one? So you've got about 10 minutes, uh, sorry, 10 seconds to go. 10 minutes would be too long. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. And the correct answer is 3,400. So as it turns out, not many of you guessed this, but this is the number of active satellites that are currently in orbit around the Earth. But there are many more that are, you know, not active anymore, uh, which we call space junk. Um, moving on to the next, or looking at our scoreboard after this first question. Uh, Amazing Llama is in the first place uh, position. Now remember, the faster you answer your questions, the more points you get. So get those answers in quickly. Our next question is, what was the name of the first artificial satellite to go around the Earth? Was it Apollo 1? Was it Lyra? Was it Orion? Or was it Sputnik? So which of these satellites uh, describes the name of the first satellite that was in orbit around the Earth. And its image is slowly being revealed. Uh, as you can see right here, you've got about five seconds left to answer. So get those answers in quickly. And the correct answer is Sputnik. And congratulations, most of you got this correct. Amazing. So yes, Sputnik is a Russian satellite, which was the first uh, to orbit around the Earth. Looking again at our scoreboard, we have Mountain Turtle, who has moved to the lead with a radiant lemur uh, in a close second place. Let's see how many of you can catch up. So 
What was the first musical instrument in space? Was it a guitar, a harmonica, a flute, or a saxophone? So which of these musical instruments was the first to be played in space? So you've got about 12 seconds left. Get those answers in quickly, everyone. Was it a guitar, a harmonica, a flute, or a saxophone that was the first musical instrument in space? Time's up, and most of you got the answer correct, amazing. So it was in fact a harmonica, which you might have guessed because it'd be easy to sneak in. Uh, and apparently one of the uh, Gemini 6 astronauts uh, smuggled a harmonica aboard uh, the Gemini 6 spacecraft and used it to play jingle bells, which is super lovely. Looking again at our scoreboard, we have Hero Bunny who has moved to the first place, that's amazing. Uh, let's see if anyone else can catch up to them. So how many humans in total have been to space that is reached Earth orbit or further? So is it 24 people? Is it 103, 306, or 533? How many humans have actually been to space? So how many of humans have gone to Earth orbit or farther into space? We've got about five seconds left. Four, three, two, one. And most of you did not get the answer correct. It is in fact 533 people have made it to Earth orbit or further. So that includes a bunch of astronauts who've gone to the International Space Station, have gone up into shuttles, uh, a few tourists here and there. So it's actually 533 people in total. Looking again at our scoreboard, Hero Bunny has maintained their lead with Expert Wombat in a close second place. Let's see if anyone else can catch up. Our next question is, what is the furthest that any human has ever traveled into space? Is it the International Space Station, the Moon, Mars, or the location of the Hubble Space Telescope? So what's the farthest that any human being has ever traveled into space? Get those answers in quickly. Remember, the faster you answer, the more points you get. You've got four, three, two, one second left, and time's up. And most of you got the correct answer. Excellent job. The moon is the farthest uh, distance that any person has ever gone into space. So that's about 385,000 kilometers away on average. And uh, that is the farthest that anyone has ever traveled into space. Looking once again at our scoreboard, Hero Bunny is maintaining their lead. Let's see how everyone does on the next question, which is what was the name of the Apollo 11 lunar lander? Was it the Beagle, the Songbird, the Eagle, or the Falcon? So what was the name of the Apollo 11 lunar lander? The Apollo 11 lunar lander being the first lander with people in it that went onto the moon. So was it the Beagle, the Songbird, the Eagle, or the Falcon? We've got about three seconds left. Two, one, time is up. And most of you got it. It was indeed the Eagle. So you might have heard the eagle has landed. That was in reference to the Apollo 11 lunar lander. Once again, looking at our scoreboard before the before last question, Hero Bunny is maintaining their lead. Excellent job to you. Our before last question is, what is the proposed name for the future NASA moon settlement? It is, is it Artemis Base Camp, Apollo Gateway, Moon Base Alpha or Boots on the Moon. So what is the name of this future proposed NASA moon settlement? And if you were paying attention to some talks earlier in the stream, you might have heard the answer to this question. We've got about four, three, two, one seconds left. Time is up. And most of you got the correct answer. Once again, excellent job. It is in fact the Artemis Base camp. All right. 
Hero Bunny has maintained their lead, but Stellar Tiger has moved into second place. Excellent job. Our final question of the night is, what is the farthest that any man-made spacecraft has traveled into space? Is it to the moon, to Saturn, past the Kuiper belt, or to the nearest star? So what is the farthest that any man-made spacecraft has traveled into space? We have about five seconds left. Get those answers in. Your last chance. And most of you once again got it correct. It is indeed past the Kuiper belt, which is a belt of debris just past the orbit of Neptune in our solar system. And the spacecraft that has traveled the farthest into space is the Voyager 1 probe, uh, which has reached an, a region of the solar system called the heliopause, which is where it no longer feels the effects of the solar wind coming off of the sun. So now that we've answered all the questions, we can find out who won this thing. In third place, we have Arctic Dingo. Excellent job. In second place, we have Classy Camel, great name. And our first place winner, getting all questions correct, is Hero Bunny. Congratulations to you. So we'll be getting in contact once again with the winners, as long as you put your actual email address into, the, uh, into Kahoot. Um, of course, if you won a prize in the first round, unfortunately, you're not eligible to win a prize in the second round. But you can indeed um, Make sure, or you will. So we'll go down the list, and whoever won after you, so we'll get in touch. You, you'll know. And of course, uh, one person will be getting uh, a Dunlop T-shirt uh, randomly drawn from all the participants. So next, we have we're going to go back to Emily Debert, who's going to lead us through some observations of some deep sky objects. So back to you, Emily. Thanks, Alana, and hello again, everyone. I hope you've been having a good night so far. Um, if you didn't meet me earlier, as you just heard, my name is Emily, and I'm an astronomer at the University of Toronto. Um, so most of the objects that we've seen so far tonight are things that you can see with your naked eye. But right now, we're going to take a bit of a step back, and we're going to look at the very distant universe through some of the most spectacular telescopes owned by our RESC members. Um, don't forget to please share your photos with us on social media throughout the night. Uh, we're at Dunlop Institute on Twitter and Instagram. And if you tag us with hashtag Planet Party, you can get another chance to win one of those cool Dunlop t-shirts. Um, we've been seeing a lot of great photos come in so far, so please keep sharing them. Um, so I think first up, we will check in with Ian Wheelband, who is in Nova Scotia. I have too many clouds right now. So how's it going, Ian? Hi, Emily. view of my telescope. This is a different telescope that I was using for the planet images. It's smaller. Um, someone, this one is only about 130 centimeters, millimeters in diameter. Right. So in old school, that would be a five inch refractor. Um, so lens is bending the light instead of mirrors bouncing the light. But right. it does a good job as you see. So so this, this is a um, uh, an example of an object that uh, there's quite a number of them, several hundred up in, in our galaxy. Um, and it's, it's so called, you know, it's named planetary nebula because mm -hmm. in the telescopes that first started looking, they weren't very good and, and they looked disc like, like a planet might look. So they thought, well, they must be some sort of planetary something or other planetary right. cloud. And now we know that what they are is a big shell of gas, um, getting blown away from an aged and an aging star and you oh, can wow. see, yeah you can see that star right in the very center here of the of the nebula i'll move the hand away so you can see it right. it's, it's quite dim um it's a leftover white dwarf uh, from a star that is you know much like the sun and has gone through its lifetime and um as the star ages um, it swells up bigger and bigger getting less gravity less mass using the mass to to make to make light and energy, but it, it, it gets less gravity because of the less mass. So the star gets bigger and bigger, and eventually it can't hold on to the outer layers of its atmosphere. So it blows it off into space. And we see that as 
expanding shells. And even this one, you, you can see there's like a shell of gas here, another football shaped shell here. The tips of the edges have more hydrogen gas from another part of, a, of the, the atmosphere that was blown off. Lots of, uh, of oxygen and, and uh, things like that in, in this nebula. Right. And, and so uh, the colors, is that telling us these different uh, gases that we're seeing here? That's yeah. We get all these colors? Yeah, I think my, Michael uh, Williams is going to try and show us a, a ring nebula spectrum. But yeah, yeah it, it is showing us that too, because this is this nebula is glowing at, at the specific wavelength colors of, of these chemicals. And, and the red is the hydrogen that's glowing and, and the greenish blue, the really pretty green. That's one of my favorite favorite shades of, of greenish yeah. blue um, is, is, you know, more oxygen. I think there's some nitrogen in there as well. Huh. Um, um, and and so it, it's uh, they're, re they're really pretty. Now, if we were looking through the telescope live, we would see all the detail we see here. But in this planetary nebula itself, we would not see the colors. Um, right. Some of some of the brighter ones you can see the the, the, the very pretty um, um, bluish green. Not this one. This one looks like a black and white smoke ring. Um, right. And the, because it's an extended object, the, 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 um, the smaller things like the stars, I don't know if you notice that the star down here actually has a slightly orange hue to it. You can yeah. see star colors in, in, in even relatively small telescopes because it's a, a pinpoint of light for what our eye sees. They're, of course, just like as big as our sun when they're far away. But uh, right. uh, And this object itself is on the order of 2,000 light years away. And you oh, can, wow. Yeah, you remember that the moon is a light second away, and we were looking at Jupiter and Saturn, roughly a light hour, and now here we go, 2,000 light years away. So this is much, much further than what we were looking at before. Um, and so really, we're looking at something much further back in time, too. This is something very ancient that we're looking at. Yeah, that's a really good point, Emily. Um, and, I, and I look at a telescope as a time machine because of that. Yeah. Because we really are seeing this, that, that the... The time when when you know Christ was born. I mean, this is the light that has been traveling all that time just for us. And uh, and, and this also, I, I maybe I'll mention this as well is a live view tonight. Um, the planets uh, much closer, much brighter. I only need like a second or so to capture their image, and so they right. would update regularly. This one's updating about once every thirty seconds, but it oh, is wow. still it is still a live image. Um, so you're seeing it just as quick as I am maybe yeah. with a, maybe a little delay from no yeah, it's a long exposure yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah wow that looks great yeah um and how many similar kind of objects to this are there in the sky oh there's there's several hundred really pretty um uh planetary nebula some are very very small some are quite big um if there's time I'll show another one I'll move to another one while we're talking to Mike Williams but if, if there's not time, well, that's just the way it goes. But uh, yeah, there's lots of them. There, uh, some amateur astronomers, this is their favorite object, the planetaries. Me personally, I like galaxies, but you know, <laughs> that's okay. But these are really beautiful too. Yeah, these are really I nice to so. see. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Everyone, Ian. Uh, so we'll different. hop over to Mike and okay. we'll see how he's doing there and we'll check back in with you in a bit. Thanks. So Mike, is do you have an okay view there? Hopefully it's not clouded. Hi, Emily. Uh, so unfortunately, it is actually clouded out. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, but always come prepared. So I have I have a spectrum that was taken actually a couple of years ago now okay. uh, of the Ring Nebula. Um, but I'm just going to start out with just reminding people what spectra is. So spectra is taking the light and spreading it out into a rainbow, and then we can take a picture of it. Uh, so I have this um, thing called a diffraction grating, which I can put in front of the web camera. And we can spread the light out from the uh, from the um, uh, fluorescent lights in the room, and we can see uh, the rainbow. Uh, and in some of them, you can see bright lines. Um, and so those bright yeah. lines is mercury vapor in the uh, in the fluorescent tubes, glowing at very specific wavelengths. Wow. Um, and that's what we're going to see when we look at the ring nebula. Um, so. So Ian was talking about updating the picture every 30 seconds. Um, this is actually 30 minutes worth of, of uh, oh, wow. integrating. So spectra takes a lot longer to actually um, uh, image than, than uh, 
than taking an image, partly because you're right. just taking all that light and then spreading it out. So you have right. less light. So you need a lot of time. Each individual pixel. Right. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Um, so you talked about a white dwarf in the center of the uh, of the um, nebula, and so this what we call continuum spectrum um, that I circled. This is the light from that white dwarf, um, right. and so that looks kind of like the spectrum we got from from uh, Saturn. You have light going right across all the wavelengths, um, and so just to remind you, if you go across the image, you're looking at different wavelengths. And then if you go up in the image, you're looking at different parts of the nebula. Um, right. Uh, and then all this stuff here in the center, so this stuff here that goes from the top of the image all the way to the bottom, those are the lights of Toronto. Um, so this <laughs> is a really good example of why you don't build an observatory in the middle of the largest city in Canada. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there's there's a lot of a lot of light pollution that we have to deal with. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but these lines here, these this is the nebula itself. Uh, so there and there. Uh, okay. So these lines are red. These lines are blue. Um, and so this this one on the far left um, might be on the far right because it's uh, reversing stuff for me. Um, but I just drew an arrow to it. Um, that's due to hydrogen. That's a hydrogen okay. beta line. And what you notice with the hydrogen lines is they actually don't go all the way across. It sort of stops here and here. So it's right. like that ring. Um, so again, Ian said, you know, you tend to see that red uh, more out to the edge, which is where you really see the hydrogen well. Right. Um, and then the two lines that you can sort of make up next to it, those are due to oxygen. Um, and they're a bit brighter all the way across. And then over on the other side, the same thing. So an oxygen line there and a hydrogen line there. And the hydrogen line, again, is very, very dim in the middle and brighter at the edges. Uh, so, so even though it looks like this big, colorful thing, the light's actually only coming out at very specific wavelengths for the nebula. Um, right, yeah. And so we call that type of nebula emission. It, it's like comes from emission lines instead of a continuum. Right, and that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. Thank you, that's really interesting. Yeah, so this is kind of another way of seeing what Ian was showing us, those same colors. And from what you're showing us here, we can actually tell which chemicals are making those colors. That's really cool to see. Thank you. Um, so I think now we will hop over to Francois Van Heerden, who's another RISC member in Trenton. Um, I'm, I know it's cloudy in Trenton right now, but I think Francois is prepared with some backup images from last night. Hi, Francois. How's it Hi, going? How are you this evening, Emily? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. So one of the first ones that I will share for you as soon as I can get it here. I just have to escape from one of these here. Just give me two split seconds here. Uh, just got to bring it up. It is this, which is the North American Nebula with the Cygnus wall. Can you see that? Oh, wow. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, that looks okay. spectacular. So you can actually see here where it goes down to Florida, and then we have the Gulf of Mexico. We go oh, in yeah. here. This portion here of Mexico and California is known as the Cygnus wall. Wow. So this is actually a gigantic piece. And then over here is the Pelican Nebula. So this is the pelican's head over here, oh, yeah. slightly reversed. This is actually in the area of Cygnus, the swan in the night sky. Right. This is, believe it or not, a 15 second image with the Mellon cam with a hyperstar on an eight inch telescope. So it actually gives me a four degree field of view. This oh. object is basically 10 moon diameters in oh, the wow. night sky but you have to be in a really dark sky to be able to see it with the unaided eye as a hazy right. patch. Right. Uh, so I actually got this from a location in Quebec, Matan, Quebec, earlier this month. And it was well worth the trip out there to be able to just view this with your unaided eye. 
If people wanted to do this and see it, they would need to go to one of the dark sky sites close to Toronto. They could come to the Lennox Addington or go to Torrance Barrens, look in the neighborhood of Cygnus the Swan, and then to the bottom left-hand side of it, you would be able to see this object. Right. Yeah, so we couldn't see this downtown, unfortunately, but it's not too hard to get there from Toronto if you're in Toronto and hopefully be able to see this yourself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that is the one image I have. And then I can also just flip over to people like to see lots of stars. And I'm yes. just going to go <laughs> here. That is towards the center of our galaxy. That is M24, the Sagittarius star cloud. So, I think I'm still seeing the same image here. Oh, okay. Hang on two seconds. Oh, let yeah, me thanks. just stop sharing for a moment and then let me go over to the other one. Let's do this. You can build up some. For, there it is. Now I see it. There it is. So Center this of... is the Sagittarius star cloud. When we were hearing about this is where above the teapot, the actual spout of the teapot looking towards the center of the galaxy, this particular object is just above that area that Chris was describing for us. Right. This is, believe it or not, a grand total of 10 seconds. And you can oh, actually wow. see star colors appearing in there. This is littered with stars. So people have always said to me, geez, I want to see lots of stars. Yeah. <laughs> a pair of binoculars will allow right. you to see a lot of this. Wow. A little bit further up from it, you would have the wild duck cluster, an absolutely phenomenal object. So looking towards the center of our galaxy is littered with incredible objects that people would be able to grab just with a simple pair of binoculars. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it's a totally different environment, I think, from where we are in the galaxy, where it's not quite so dense like this. Absolutely. Yeah, thank and you. I believe Ian, or no, Chris says he has Alberio, so he can actually yes, show I us think... star colors. Yeah, let's jump over to Chris. Hopefully the weather's still holding out there. So Chris is in Hello. Collingwood right now. Hi, Chris. How's it going there? I am. It's going well. We feel like we're in a typhoon, but that's okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was Let me very windy there my before. Live view. So this is um this is a live view through a Canon 60D DSLR mounted to an eight inch telescope, and you can see though those two stars are dancing in the center of the view. Yeah. The lower one is uh, brighter; it's it's a golden color, and the upper one, not too clear in this view, but it's actually a blue color. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a frame that I took a moment ago. Let's see if I can bring this one out. There you go. Now I can see the, the beautiful golden color in the bottom one and a slight bluish tint in the top. In a yeah. telescope, those remind me of topaz and sapphire. I love oh, those. wow. Yeah. So this star is Alberio. It's the beak of the Cygnus the Swan. If you look at the big summer triangle that Mike pointed out at the beginning of the, of the evening, yeah. the Alberio is a dim star. You can see it with your naked eye, but it's in the sort of center of that those three stars. It's kind of like the middle of the flux capacitor from back to the future, if yeah. you like to imagine it like that. And yeah. to the naked eye, it looks like one star, but in binoculars, okay. it splits into two. And in a telescope, it they, they, they really separate out into this beautiful pair. One yeah. is, um, the, so the blue one is hot. It's about uh, 11,000 K and the yellow oh, and wow. the yellow one is about 4,400 K. And we think they're just a line of sight coincidence that they're not orbiting one another. They just happen to be in the same direction of the sky. Oh, wow. Alberio. Yeah, that's really given, neat. Yeah, so, given that single name before telescopes were invented, before anybody knew there were two. Oh, wow. So do they still have just both of them together have that name still? Or do they have their own separate names for each one? Yeah, so collectively they're called Alberio. That's their proper name. But their their astronomical designation would be um, Beta Cygni. Mm -hmm. And it's Beta 1, 2 Cygni. So star right. 1, star 2. Generally the brighter one is number 1 and the dimmer star is number 2. So yeah, anybody can see this with a small telescope. Doesn't have to be a big telescope. Just point it at that little star in the middle of the triangle, focus it, and you should see the pair, and you should be able to see the colors. 
Yeah, and that's really neat to see the colors too and just think about those temperatures, that blue one being so much hotter than our own sun, for example, and, you know, really being able to see that in the colors there. So there's the there's this and here's the sky a live view, right? Yeah, here we go. Yeah. yeah, and I think you can almost yeah, you can at least see one of them's brighter for sure. Oh definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um so maybe we can quickly check back in with Ian and see if Ian has another Yeah, I do hey. have one more image here. This is a another part of the planetary that we did. It hasn't managed to find its way to you. Yeah, you can see that okay, there now. Sure. Yeah, there we yeah. go. Yeah, so so this one is, is uh, the dumbbell nebula. Um, you know, maybe so this is the same kind of object as what we were seeing before, right? As the ring nebula. That's correct. Yeah, okay. and uh, it kind of shows the difference in the styles of planetary nebula. Um, yeah. Uh, some bits the same. You know, we've still got our different colors of gases uh, being emitted, and we still got our hot central star in the center. That that little you know the leftover um, white dwarf. Um, but this this one's a completely different shape and size and and um, re really kind of cool. Two two things about these. I mean, number one, where they are in the sky. We've been talking tonight about summer triangle and Christmas, you know, of, of Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And Chris was just talking about the flux capacitor Alberio in the center of that triangle. Yeah. This is, is sort of just below that area. Um, of, of, of Alberio in, in the constellation Volpecula, very close. And our ring nebula was right up very close to, to uh, Vega. Um, right. So all of this is in that, the summer skies. The other thing I wanted to mention, we've talk, talked about Messier objects. This is Messier 27. The other one was Messier 57. That's from a gentleman named Charles Messier, a Frenchman who was a comet hunter about 250 years ago or so. And, and uh, right. he, he kept coming across these objects that were in the same place in the sky and thought, oh, I, I'm just not going to look at this again because it's not a comet, what I'm looking for. It turns out that, all, that these hundred or so objects that he cataloged are, um, are some of the nicest objects to view in the sky. So yeah. we still call them with, with their Messier designation. They got all kinds of other numbers too. And this is Dumbbell or some people call it the Apple Core Nebula. Yeah, I can see that too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, how many of these objects do you think you've seen? Oh, boy, I've probably, <laughs> seen, I've probably seen maybe 50 or so planetary nebula. Chris, oh. keeps, Chris keeps bending my ear and say, let's go look at this one, Ian. <laughs> I think there's some of his favorites, <laughs> the little dim ones. I like the ARP galaxies. There you go. And we, yeah, we, he, he's dragged me to more than a few of those. Yeah. And, and, yeah. This is maybe just a hair closer. Than, yeah. than, um, than, than the ARP galaxies, but also than, than, than the ring nebula we looked at too. I think this, this is, uh, you know, has been estimated to be slightly closer, but still on that order of 2,000 light years. Yeah, so again, this is a really kind of distant ancient object that we're looking at here again. Yeah, it is, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. From, from a star that's uh, like twice as old as our sun. I think our, our sun's about 5 billion. It'll look like this in maybe another 5 billion years. Right, yeah. Hopefully, well, so we won't feel that here. So. was about 400 light years away. Yeah, so again, that's another quite far object. So we are really looking deep into the universe with all of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we are. We are. Really that's cool. great. Thanks so much, Ian. My um, I, I think if we have time, uh, Francois has one more really nice image to maybe show us. If we have the time to hop over there. Maybe have a galaxy to is actually the Andromeda galaxy with its two companions. So the Andromeda galaxy, again, is larger than the moon in the night sky. Wow. When you actually use a pair of binoculars, it is actually the most distant thing you can see with the unaided eye as a small hazy patch. Oh, wow. So that is 2.5 uh, million light years away from us. It is on a collision course with our galaxy, but it's going to happen long after our Earth is gone. Yeah, <laughs> and then it's got M one ten, which is just above up here. Right. Oh, sorry, M. This is M thirty M thirty two, M thirty one. Sorry, M thirty one, M thirty two, and M one ten. The M one ten is wow. down at the bottom here. Yeah. This is a grand total of five ten second images stacked. 
Wow. So I literally just took five 10 second images and laid them on top of each other. And that's exactly what we've got here. Uh, it again is just rising right now in the night sky. And right. if you go to a slightly darker location than Toronto and you look above the, the two parallel uh, lines of stars and then you just go up above them for Andromeda, you will actually see this hazy patch. In the binoculars, you will only pick wow. up this portion in the center. Right. But if you scan around, you will actually pick up M32, and then if you go below, you will find M110. Oh, wow. And it, it's really incredible to think about. You're saying, you know, this is quite far, but this is actually uh, our closest neighbor, really, in terms of other galaxies. It's close by to us, so it really makes you think about the scale of the universe. It is. And again, this is larger than the moon in the night sky, but because of distance, it is dim. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was really incredible to see. Um, and thank you to everyone tonight for, for sharing all of your really incredible views. And so that's Chris and Dennis who are out in Collingwood, Mike Williams here at U of T, Francois Van Heerden who's in Trenton, and Ian Wheelband who's in Nova Scotia. Thank you so much to all of you. This was really such a treat to get to see all of this. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I hope everyone at home really enjoyed it too. Um, I will pass Thanks things so back to Mike Reed. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Emily, and to all of our presenters this evening. That brings us to the end of the 2021 Planet Party brought to you by the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto, but also especially by our good friends at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So much of what you've seen tonight has come to us via our friends at the Royal Astronomical Society. And if you're excited by what you've seen and you want to you know, learn how to see some of these things yourself, I highly recommend if you're in Canada, get in touch with the RASC at rasc.ca. They have chapters all over the country. If you're in Quebec, there is an equivalent organization, the Federation of Amateur Astronomers of Quebec, FAAQ. But no matter where you are in the world, it's very likely that there's an amateur astronomy association near you who'd be happy to teach you more about how to find your way around the sky, how to get and use a telescope, binoculars, what have you. So we hope that tonight has excited your interest in astronomy and that you'll consider coming back for more great astronomy content from the Dunlap Institute. If you've enjoyed this stream, please uh, leave us a like or a comment that really helps us make sure that our content uh, gets out to as many people as possible. I wanted to just finish up by thanking a few people who've been working behind the scenes. So in the chat tonight, we had Bethany Ludwig, who is a graduate student at the University of Toronto, who's been answering a lot of your science questions, and Kara Manovich, our events officer, who has been answering your uh, logistical questions. And underlying all of this is Megan McSween, our communications person. So if you heard about this event, it was likely because of Megan's hard work. So thank you very much, everybody. We hope you've enjoyed this stream. We'll likely be doing this again at some point in the future. We'll see how the pandemic evolves, but we'll either see you in person or online. Have a good night, everybody.